फाइव फोर थ्री टू वी आर लाइव गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन थैंक यू ऑल फॉर ज्वाइनिंग दिस इवनिंग द फोर्थ एनुअल इंडो यूएस हैंड सर्जरी कॉन्फ्रेंस some of you might know that we had held the previous three at hubli dharwad and manipal last year and we were supposed to be in cmc velour this year but uh, thanks to covid we decided to switch streams and go uh, virtual with this we on behalf of all the faculty and myself as the organizing chairman uh, welcome you to this conference and also offer a sincere hope that you all stay safe and the situation with covid in india becomes manageable very soon The conference has traditionally been held over one and a half days, but since we can't do that, we've organized it as five virtual sessions to be held on every Saturday in the month of May at the same time, which is 8 p.m. Indian Standard Time. The theme is uh, how I do it, and uh, we will be focusing on uh, tips and tricks from a surgical perspective to address real-life situations. We have five sessions, as I said. the first session will be today dedicated to metacarpal and phalangeal fractures we will then focus on nerve and tendinopathies followed by tendon injuries and combined injuries and finally uh, with wrist and elbow to bring up uh, the last session the the good thing about today's uh, this current meeting is that despite the fact that we've called it the indo us hand surgery conference traditionally we are very lucky this year to have faculty not only from the uk but also from canada so this is really getting international we would like to thank our sponsors namely the vis medical foundation the deshpande foundation venus health and safety and last but not least the indian society for surgery of the hand for those of you who might be uh, wanting to ask questions after each talk you will scroll below to the video uh, below the video on ortho tv and there is a the chat box there in which you can type your questions all your mics and uh, video have been uh, silenced with that being said i'd like to have uh, steve shorts uh, say a few words steve is an old friend with the focus being on friend and not old he and i go back many years he's the ceo of ao north america and he's also intimately involved with the hansi org vis foundation who are one of our sponsors so steve may i hand it over to you Thank you uh thank you so so much and it is uh indeed a pleasure that that I join you this evening um and uh, I'm I'm humbled and honored to be uh to be with all of you. I would like to um first of all share my my heartbreak at what's happening in India uh, with the covid and hope that everybody on this call uh on this uh, Zoom stay safe. and be careful and i i just wish only good things and hope that the uh the situation can be uh improved in very short order um it's uh it, it, we we've we've been friends for such a long time and it's uh i i thank you for reminding me of my age because i try to forget it while you stay so young but we've we've no chai and i have known each other since decades i think and it's been so uh, impressive to watch Chai continued to lead uh the uh, the hand surgery education for AO North America and I can't say enough to compliment you and congratulate you on all you've done. We rely upon Chai and his knowledge and his passion so much. He will never state that, but it means a tremendous amount to us in AO North America. So so thank you Chai and thank you for your friendship and for um all you, all you do for me personally and for us. And it's on that basis Chai's passion and I'm sorry this is not the Chai Mugdal uh uh feature here but I have to say that it's thanks to your passion and commitment that we uh also for, through the Weiss Medical Foundation were pleased and proud to provide you with a substantial amount of financial support to be able to conduct these activities and I wish that we could be doing this uh in the Indian subcontinent rather than via um the digital means but maybe this is a sign of a way that we can adapt for the future to take advantage of of both technologies uh, or to of this technology and a live uh, activity as well and uh, lastly i think i'd be re remiss if i didn't say uh, one of the things that chai and i like to talk about is his passion for the mumbai indians which uh, i think are playing this evening as we speak so uh, mumbai versus chennai i'll try to keep my eye on the lectures and not on the uh, cricket 
but uh, in all seriousness, uh, thank you for, for, for recognizing me, Chai, but it goes to you and all that you do to support this group, you and your colleagues, and thank you once again. Thank you, Steve. Uh, for the audience, the program today is uh, well packed and we are gonna be starting off uh, with Heyman Patankar from India, who's going to talk to us about P1 and P2 fractures. We'll follow that up with Pankaj Jahiri talking about hemihamate replacement arthroplasties. Ravi Bardaj from Kolkata is going to talk to us about MP dislocations. Uh, I will then talk about plate osteosynthesis, followed by Abhijit Vaigankar from Pune, who's going to talk about intramedullary fixation. And we are going to round it off with uh, uh, Becky Nadeski from Elon University in North Carolina, who's going to talk to us about rehabbing hand stiffness. We will have case discussions, which will be interspersed and also at the end. And those are going to be ably conducted by Ajit Shankar and Parag Lad. So with that being said, I'm going to uh, share my screen and start off with Hemant. I'm going to ask everyone else to please uh, shut the cameras off and mute the mics, please. Good evening. My talk today is on close spinning for fractures. Dr. Chetan, sound gone. Dr. Chetan, you will have to unmute yourself. However, this method is unreliable and quite frustrating at times, especially in transverse fractures of the shaft and can lead to myelinia. Dr. Chetan, there is one small error when sharing so, the screen. I will you be would want just on pause the video, we will have to restart it. For yeah. transverse and short okay. oblique fractures. Give me one second. Now, when sharing the screen, share computer sound. Present with video clip. angulation. And this fracture combination, as shown, is ideal to be treated with anti grade intrapedal pinning. After the close reduction, the fractures can be stabilized with uh, uh, multiple pins of 1 to 0.8 to 1 millimeter diameter. And the uh, patient can be mobilized very early with this method. Transverse short oblique uh, fractures of the P1 and P2, which are extra articular and which present early so that they can be reduced by closed means are suitable to be treated by closed spinning techniques. Closed spinning also is possible by the interfragmentary method. However, this method is unreliable and quite frustrating at times, especially in transverse fractures of the shaft and can lead to myelunion, non-union, and tendon impalement while inserting the pins, and of course, joint stiffness. So, I will be speaking on intramedullary pinning for transverse and short oblique fractures. Transverse fractures present with a apex volar angulation, and this fracture combination, as shown, is ideal to be treated with anti-grade intramedullary pinning which gives a three-point fixation. After the close reduction, the fractures can be stabilized with uh, uh, multiple pins of 1 to 0.8 to 1 millimeter diameter, and the uh, patient can be mobilized very early with this method. This technique is an adaptation of the intramedullary K-wire fixation uh, uh, described by Guy Fouché in 1976 for metacarpal neck fractures. It was adapted by Gonzalez et al. and presented in this journal. This patient presented 10 days post-injury with a severe angulation of the proximal phalanx as seen. There is a, a transverse fracture in the distal shaft. The point to be noted is that there is a thick intact volar cortex. And this is very important for the second point of fixation in this three-point uh, pinning technique. Uh, which I'll show you shortly. Uh, with sustained traction, even after presenting on the 10th day, with sustained traction, we could get a close reduction in this case, following which we proceeded to insert the pins. Uh, incision is taken over the base of the proximal phalanx 
to identify the extensor tendon and the extensor tendon is split in the midline. This is the safest thing to do as discussed in this paper. The bone entry is made 5 millimeters distal to the joint line and the bone is entered uh, with a small owl or a thin K wire. The, uh, the hole is enlarged with a curved bent K wire and uh, which is also helps to locate the intramedullary canal. And a one millimeter K wire is used, which uh, is inserted initially with the hand or uh, K wire held on the T handle and inserted up to the fracture site. Once the fracture site is reached as seen on the C arm, the wire is rotated in such a way that the curve of the wire faces on the volar aspect of the uh, distal uh, fragment of the proximal phalanx in such a way that once the reduction is maintained with the hand manually and the wire is advanced up to the subchondral bone. Multiple wires of 1 millimeter or 1 and 0.8 millimeters can be uh, inserted depending on the shape of the or size of the intramedullary canal and it helps to augment the fracture stability. Now, this is the three point fixation which is achieved. The first, the first two points of fixation or the interference fit are in the near fragment or the proximal fragment in this case. The third point is in the far fragment or the distal fragment in this case. The wires are then cut as close as possible to the bone. Not more than uh, one millimeter K wires are used. In the middle phalanx, in fact, I prefer to use 0.8 millimeter K wires. These K wires are pre bent and blunted by cutting their sharp tips. We don't require to use a power instrument. A T handle, a short T handle can be used. The uh, extensor tendon can be uh, just gently retracted with blunt skin hooks so that there should not be any injury to the extensor tendon by inserting the wire. A sharp cutter is used to cut the wires as close as possible to the bone and the tendon is sutured on top of that. This patient presented directly after three years. You can see an excellent remodeling of the bone with no loosening of the wires. That is the advantage of this three-point fixation method by which because of the interference fit, the wires don't become loose. There is no uh, damage to the tendon or the joint later on and the patient can regain full flexion extension of the hand with full normal function. Even in the fractures of the uh, neck of the proximal phalanx, this method can be used. However, one must ensure one must ensure that there is no intraarticular extension uh, in such cases and then this method can be used. This is a two years post-op of this patient. This uh, series was written by me uh, initially, in the case of uh, in 35 patients, I have written about it in this journal in 2008. This advantage of this method is you can get a stable fixation after achieving anatomic reduction. The anatomic reduction, in fact, is maintained by inserting multiple wires into the intramedullary canal. This ten technique is tendon sparing. This is joint sparing and no, pro neither the proximal nor the distal joint is involved or uh, penetrated by this uh, K wires and we can really uh, mobilize the patients early. Now, what is the limit of this anti-grade intramedullary fixation? Fractures which are just distal to the mid shaft of the proximal phalanx at the distal third of the proximal phalanx or the neck can be easily treated with this. Fractures which are slightly proximal or slightly proximal to the midline, a mid shaft cannot be treated by this as I'll show you in this example. You can see in this case, the three point fixation method, uh, three point fixation is not achieved. The two points of the fixation are in the distal fragment here, in the distal fragment here. And that's why by inserting these multiple wires, the fracture is getting displaced. So this is an unstable construct and this fixation, uh, this method should not be employed in fractures which are uh, proximal to the mid shaft of the proximal phalanx. So in these cases, we, uh, I prefer to use this retrograde intramedullary wiring technique. Here the wires are inserted from the 
uh, insertion of the collateral ligaments here and was inserted in the retrograde manner in such a way that the wires are directed to the molar side of the proximal phalanx. You can see that there is a lot of space here, lot of uh, space in the proximal phalanx on the molar side. The uh, wires will have be held very nicely in this case. And that's the result at two years post-op. Now, this is a case where there is a comminuted fracture of the proximal third. That's the combination. The fracture is slightly oblique. After studying this X-ray uh, properly and in great detail, this is the method of fixation that we have, uh, I have achieved. A single K-wire, one millimeter diameter was inserted in such a way that these two points, this is also a three-point fixation. However, the uh, the first two points of fixation are in the near fragment because the wires are inserted from the distal side. So this becomes the near fragment. And the third point of fixation is here. That is the uh, proximal fragment here. So this is a, again a three-point fixation. Held, the fracture is held very in a very stable manner by this. You can see that the uh, fractures are mobilized. You can see also see that the immediate extension is not available or achieved, but full flexion is achieved. And the fracture unites very well. You can see the early callus here. The extension lag is due to the fact that the wire is still on. And the, however, the patient has recovered full flexion. And at one year post-op, the wire was removed. And you can see that the patient has achieved full extension and full flexion. Now, this case, again, these are very problematic fractures. These are very, very proximal fractures, but extra-articular. They, they always present with a severe deformity and severe displacement. The problem is to get a proper lateral view in this case to know the real problem or real situation. The, typically, they present with a deformed finger, which is unable to flex. And as you know, the anatomy of the proximal phalanx the proximal part is surrounded very closely with extensor and flexor tendon. So, the anatomical reduction is very essential and maintenance of the reduction is highly essential. Even slight disparity in the uh, reduction can hurt the flexor tendons and cause this becomes a focal point for adhesions and the flexion uh, and extension can be restricted in this case. So, this patient presented with a severe deformity, severe displacement of the proximal phalanx. This present patient again presented very early. This was treated with closed reduction and intramedullary fixation. The wires are inserted from the sides of the proximal phalanx here. The fracture is sealed. In this case, or in all these cases where the proximal extraarticular fractures are there, the wires have to be removed very early as early as possible once you are uh, clinically the fracture is healed and this patient you can see even after early k wire removal he has got full flexion there is a slight extensor lag which will gradually recover with time this patient again pre presented with a deformity with a loss of flexion and a rotation of the finger he had a comminuted extra articular fracture of the proximal phalanx proximal part this was again treated with an uh, insertion of the wires through the collateral approach and the wires are inserted intramedullary. Once the wires are removed, you can see that the fracture is remodeled and healed perfectly and that is the full flexure and extension which has recovered. So in the middle phalanx also, a mini miniaturization of the same technique of the anti-grade intramedullary fixation uh, I have described. This was a case of a crush injury of the middle phalanx with a fingertip injury also. You can see a fracture which is severely displaced, but however, the fracture is pattern is nearly transverse. This was treated with a 2 millimeter, uh, initially treated with a, uh, a close reduction is done in these cases. And then a 2 millimeter wire is used as an owl. And the entry is just articular. And the same K wire or another K wire can be used to uh, just uh, seek the intramedullary canal. And 
then reduction is again uh, re-achieved. And here you can see a three-point fixation. You can see this is the first point of fixation. The second point, the curved wire abuts against the intact polar cortex. And then it is entered into the uh, distal part of the middle phalanx. And you can see that the fracture is coming close. It's a 0.8 millimeter wire. The middle phalanx is a very flat, thin bone. So we have to use a T handle and really push the wires in. This requires some practice and it is better to practice on a proximal phalanx before you go on to the middle phalanx. The second wire is inserted after the seating the first wire. And you can see even a slight gap which can be compressed manually. This is the manual compression achieved. And the fracture is completely healed here, as you can see. And that is the full flexion and extension of the finger post-operatively. The fracture seemingly impossible, but with patience and studying the X-ray properly, make sure that there is a fracture is uh, extra-articular. Seems to be impossible to treat with the anti-grade method. One would go for a cross-spinning technique in this. However, by sustained traction, we get a reduction. And here also 0.8 millimeter, two K-wires are used. And this anti-grade method is used. And because it's a very minimally invasive method, this is preferred over cross K wires method. And you can see at one year's post op, the patient has recovered full flexion and extension. This, this technique for middle phalanges was written by me in 2014 in this journal. So, in conclusion, a proper selection of the patient. Proper location of the fracture is very important and careful study of the X-rays pre-op to know whether the where is the intact cortex and what is the uh, fracture anatomy is very important. Close reduction should be achieved manually. The K-wires do not give a close reduction. They can maintain the close reduction. Blunt and three-bend K-wires, maximum one millimeter diameters are used in this technique. And they are hand driven, there is no need for power instrument. The entry point should be as far as away from the fracture site to facilitate three point fixation. Antigrade pinning is ideal for distal shaft and neck fractures. For proximal shaft fractures, I prefer to use a collateral ligament approach. I thank you all for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Eamon. That was fantastic. Um, I'm, your yeah, results are very, very impressive. Could you share with us a little bit about how you rehab them? Hello. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, rehab in the way, uh, now we take the first example, when there is a fracture of the proximal phalanx, mid shaft or distal shaft, actually when you stack the canal with multiple wires, we can start immediate mobilization. There is no need for a, a splint or anything. Only thing is we have to take care of extensor lag because really speaking, we have penetrated the extensor tendon. Yeah. So extensor lag has to be taken care of. So I, if the patient is reliable, he can start using the finger immediately. But I uh, tend to give him a, a night splint so that he does not develop a PRP joint flexion contracture. Because right. it's one of the most difficult things to treat in the hand if it gets established. Yes. So, and extensor lag can be gradually taken over. I, if the PIP joint contracture is threatening to occur, then I tend to give him a, give, give the patient a Kepner splint after about six weeks when I am sure that the fracture is united. Because yep. Kepner splint can be, a, is a sphinx splint. It yep. is known to undo the fractures if you give it before the fracture is radiologically united. Right. right. So, and uh, that is the case in the uh, shaft fractures. In the distal fractures or the, when the uh, wire is inserted from the collateral approach, then they do hurt the extensor tendons and the wires have to be removed early. Otherwise, the patient can develop a uh, pain and they, yeah. that really hurts the extensor tendons. So, you have to be aware of that and remove the wires as early as possible when the fracture unites. Do you worry about cutting the wires uh, and if they get an infection? So, that, you... uh, all the wires are cut subcutaneously or uh, under the skin. I don't keep it outside. Right. And not the so, patient. And when you cut them subcutaneously, leave enough behind that you can always take them out later. Yes, I can always take them out. Okay. okay. That's great. We don't have any 
insurance companies to dictate us whether the wires should be removed in the office or in the OT. It's my own clinic. I may not charge him, but he, yeah. I have removed the wires. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anil, any questions from the panel or from the audience before we go on to the next one? Uh, nothing yet, Chaitanya. No, no okay. questions from the audience yet. So um, let's go on with Pankaj's uh, talk, and then uh, we'll come back to uh, we'll come back to the question answers or the case discussions. Greetings of the day, everyone. I'm going to share with you a few tricks to gain good outcomes from hemiamet orthoplasty. The PIP joint fracture dislocation is one of the most uh, demanding uh, injuries. And if, if treated well, the results are very good. However, more of for stability of the joint is lost and the dislocation happens. The dorsal dislocation being much more common than the volar. The simplest trick to re restore the architecture is, of course, to put the volar structures back in place. May not always be possible. When possible, when they present fresh, a fixation is a good option. If not, a volar uh, a hemi amid arthroplasty or a volar plate arthroplasty has to be performed. And when the bony defect on the volar lip is more than 50%, a hemi amid graft is preferred. And that's that's what we are going to discuss today. And that, that's one of the time-tested options, volar plate arthroplasty. So what does hemi amid arthroplasty do? Is it takes away the all the comminuted bone fragments from the volar lip and that defect is replaced using an autograph taken uh, osteochondral autograph taken from the hammock. While performing hemi autograph, I believe there are four important steps. One is a safe dislocation of the joint, then gaining full flexion before you fix the autograft or stable graft fixation and a good soft tissue repair. Why do you require a safe dislocation? Otherwise, it can lead to a few complications which we'll discuss. The first step towards gaining a good a dislocation, a safe dislocation is to reduce overriding. And one of the ways of reducing the overriding is to use a uniplanar fixator and distract it over six to seven days and do a second stage procedure. I used to do this in the beginning. Now my preferred method is uh, undercutting the accessory collateral ligament and the joint capsule from the P2. I do not touch the ligaments on P1 and I almost never cut them transversely. So once you have released the joint, either by distraction or acutely during surgery, then you do need to do what is called a shotgun dislocation or a shotgun approach. For those who are not familiar, this is what shotgun means. That is the volar aspect of the joint and the dorsal aspect of the joint. And you hyperextend the joint so that now the defect is faces you and then you can you can do whatever type of repair you want to do in that defect. While doing so, one of the most dreaded complication is a dorsal lip fracture because it, the, the dorsal lip tends to hitch onto the neck of the P1. There is a simple trick to avoid this, which I now use in every, every hemihamet arthroplasty that I do. So before I attempt to dislocate, I put a K wire. In fact, I put two parallel K wires into the into the joint. It's not going to the bone. And then I start dislocating the joint so that the P2 base slides over these wires and does not hitch onto the P1 mm -hmm. neck. Se second problem that we face is the P2 base almost never comes to the level very level of the P1 very easily. And there is a tendency for us to push it up all the time to get a better view. And in doing so, we can cause uh, rupture of the extensor sleep, central sleep attachment. So you have to be careful that you are not overzealously pushing it out for better visualization. 
in order to gain good flexion on table you need to realize that this is a old dislocation there is a volar structure which is contracted the lateral structures are contracted the dorsal structures are adherent the extensor tendons has not been gliding for a while your approach the volar approach takes care of the volar tissues your undercutting of the ligament that i showed you takes care of the lateral structures then comes a, a step to take care of the dorsal contracted and adhered structure you need to insert a frayer's elevator or an osteotome in the in in the dislocated joint and free the soft tissues from there as far away as the middle of p1 once that is done almost always a complete flexion is achieved once the joint is ready to the the defect is ready to receive the receive the hemi hamid graph it is important to size the graph correctly here are a simple tricks for sizing harvest and fixation once you have identified the comminuted fragment just remove them remember to create a defect which is large enough to all which will allow you to fix a large graph so it will be easy easy to fix if you if if you create a very small defect then your graph size will be small your number of screws that you can put will be small and there are there are chances of graph shattering so this is the volar lip that you want to recreate but the hamid graph is not of this shape it is going to be something like this so how to take out this graft so this is the dorsal hamet fourth and fifth metacarpal this is the dorsal surface the vertical cut that you make in the hamet is very easy this the second cut the horizontal cut is the one which is difficult in order to make this cut one simple trick is we take a, we we shave off the base of the fourth and the fifth metacarpal so that our osteotome can now very easily effect this cut this that is one of the ways of uh, in, ensuring you take a good size semi hamid graft now this is a surgical case this was uh, a five and a half months old dislocation it was distracted using a unipolar fixator it was completely stiff this was a more than 50% defect we we took a volar brunner approach the skin flaps are elevated and then the a3 pulley flap is elevated once the a3 pulley flap is elevated you can you can retract the flexor tendons on either side and reach the volar plate that is the volar plate the volar plate is released from the accessory collateral ligaments that is the release of the volar plate and then you take a small osteotome and start releasing the accessory collateral ligaments from p1 that that's how i undercut it rarely you need to use a blade and then you attempt a dislocation that is a dislocation attempted flexor tendons are retracted on one side and once the shotgun approach is shotgun uh, dislocation is achieved then this is how the joint will appear this is how the joint will appear now this com these comminuted pieces will be taken out i tend to use i like to use an osteotome in hand and a small nibbler and once the defect is created remember to create a nice regular defect instead of a irregular natural defect that was presented by trauma so that placing of the graft becomes easy once you have created the defect you are ready to harvest the graft that is the incision on the dorsum of the hand that is the fourth and the fifth metacarpal and that is the hamate you make the cuts that's the vertical cut as uh, was schematically shown earlier and very carefully and gently pop the graft out you need to be extremely patient in this step cuz you don't want to create a fracture of this graft you need need a graft with a good chunk of bone and once once you have harvested it then you you start chiseling it again in order to shape it uh, to match your defect so that's from the articular side and now you start shaping it you put the graft in the defect and hold it using a 0.8 mm k wire the same hole you can later use to pass a 1 mm screw in all three screws are passed and once the screws are passed then you are ready to uh, relocate the joint 
you can you can check the stability of the joint and the movement on table that is the completed surgery and if you are doing it wide awake the way this case was done then you can check the movements on table that's on table it's stable and it's nicely mobile that was the the picture uh, on table important soft tissue closure volar plate and accessory collateral ligaments are tagged and they are allowed to heal in a flexed position we can even use anchor or a transosseous suture but the a3 pulley flap is used to cover the repairs uh, under the flexor tendons to prevent any any friction injury to the flexor tendons and this is the result that you get at the end of about 3 months uh that's at the end of about 3 months so that's all about the hemiameth arthroplasty i thank you for patient listening please join issh visit www.issh.org thank you very much that was a fantastic pankaj i'm going to uh, throw this open to the mavens of hemihamet uh, if sudhir is there or abhijit or benu uh, can you share your experiences on how you guys do the hemihamet because pankaj has shown us a bunch of tricks is is anil around this is sudhir yeah, around yeah i'm yeah. around yeah uh, and uh, is benu there yeah oh benu yeah, you're here yeah, yeah. yeah. benu we'd like to hear you first yeah most of the cases uh, which uh, we get in uh, velour are the neglected ones we rarely do get to see an acute injury where i need to do a hemi hamate and uh, you know we have described the technique which we do we use uh, exactly as uh, fungus just described and then what i do is uh, i don't transect the collateral ligaments uh, you know we just uh, sharply incise it off from the proximal phalanx head and uh, that uh, the shotgunning is very carefully done that is one of the areas where you have to be quite uh, careful and shotgunning and then once you do that and uh, <coughs> then you have to slowly remove all the soft tissue uh, adhesions on the dorsal aspect and then keep it flexed for about 5 minutes so that you can slowly stretch the dorsal soft tissue so that's a technical thing that needs to be done otherwise the chance of redislocating after your hemi hamate is also there so gently stretch the soft tissues and keep it on for 5 minutes the other thing was uh, one of the tips i would say is pre drill the hamate graft that is use a 0.8 mm and pre drill the all the three borders of the graft and follow it by that i don't take off the uh, fifth metacarpal base usually i don't i haven't found a need for that instead i use a curved osteotome so the curved osteotome is pushed in and then we take the volar cut so this is uh, has been my uh, you know technique and uh, we use it uh, with very good results right uh, uh, just uh, uh, some time ago i think uh, nikita and i presented some of the complications we saw and we saw a lot of complications i mean i made every single complication in the book so it's a very technically demanding uh, surgery and the reason i asked binu was because we saw hill hastings do it in velour i don't know which year but many 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 years ago and that just stunned all of us uh, and that's where binu actually learned from hill hastings uh, uh, there there's also a little technique a technical uh, uh, tip for making the uh, surface tilt down a little bit so that it stays very stable and then you can get the movements that pankaj was showing you know uh, uh, there is there is one question from the audience uh, what are the chances of vascular complication in his approach and how do you prevent a vascular or neuro complication in this approach do you know would you like to take that yes uh, yeah we for exposure we use a zigzag approach but as uh, we do this we very carefully incise that skin especially the, the where the angle comes because the digital neurovascular bundle is 
right there. So it's a very important question to ask. So once you're very carefully elevated the skin, the first thing to do actually is to dissect out both the neurovascular bundles carefully. So you have to dissect it out and move it away with careful, uh, um, you know, dissection and retraction also. You don't want even your assistant to be very generously pulling the neurovascular bundle so that at the end of it, suddenly the finger doesn't uh, pink up. So you have to be very careful. And one trip at this point, uh, one trick at this point is I don't know whether it really works or I just uh, do it. Before I release the tunica, I just uh, put some sensocaine around the neurovascular bundles in these kind of situations where you have to do a lot of things. I just think that, you know, it might prevent a spasm or if there was a spasm, it might uh, reduce it. Uh, I've not uh, had I, a I, vascular yeah, complication I, yet. I, I'd like to add to that. Um, it, it looks very dangerous. I'm sure <clears throat> those who haven't done a shotgun will, uh, I mean, we cringed at it the first time. We did it really, really with our hearts in our mouths. But when you look at it, once you made the dissection as Parag has shown, uh, as Pankaj has shown, and it goes all the way to the collateral ligaments and on the sides of the collateral ligaments, the moment you start shotgunning, you realize that the neurovascular bundles have gone around the condyles and therefore then they are not tense. So if you keep it in the dislocated position for as long as you want, it's not tense. It's kinked surely, but it's not tensed. When you bring it back, normally it doesn't give you, give you any trouble. So you need to be a little careful if you're doing one where there was a soft tissue injury. Then you need to do a good Doppler and a direct, I mean, a, a, an Allen's test on the Doppler and probably a direct Allen test before you actually do this. Because otherwise, then you, if, if one side is not functional, you could have a problem. There's a question I think Parag wanted to ask whether the screws, what size of screws you use, 1.3, 1.5, is what he asked. Whether which, which screws do you prefer? Personally, I use a one millimeter screw in most cases. You know your choice. Yeah, the, that's a one I also use a one millimeter mm -hmm. screw. One point three is a little bigger, and I keep that as my fallback. Sometimes the screw works itself loose. It's a very thin, slender screw, and sometimes when you're working it, it might tend to make a little larger hole and be loose. So at such a time, I would then fall back on a one point three. It's, when you look at a one point three in an Indian finger you realize it's a bit too large for the PIP joint. So uh, a one millimeter is the safest. You also must remember that you must cross the far cortex. If you have not got a hold in the far cortex, the graft will pull out. Hello. Be very careful about this, but you shouldn't cross more than half to one turn. So you can actually see that if you lift off the soft tissues, you can actually see the screw. So be very careful with that. I've got screws which are very sharply pointed on the dorsum. I've also got pullouts on three occasions where the screw hadn't crossed the far cortex. Can I make a point? Yes. yes. I think Ravi, Ravi wants to make a point. Yeah, Ravi. Uh, uh, the other thing is, I mean, when I started doing them first, the first mistake which I made initially was the shaping of the graph. You know, uh, we were so careful in getting it. Uh, but if you don't shape it properly in the trapezoidal shape, you know, you don't get the volar lip, the, you know, the projection of the volar lip to, otherwise it's a bit flat. So if you yeah. look very carefully, unless you get the graft, you know, the first few cases which I did was always the problem with that. Then I went back and looked at it and it's the shape of the graft which I was doing. So now I take it a little bit more trapezoidal and then now you get a more accurate reconstruction of the volar lip and it's more congruent, you know, and it adds to the stability, I believe. Absolutely. Yeah. But having, then, having said that, there's more and more uh, evidence and literature coming out on the fact that it doesn't actually hurt. the PIP joint doesn't look like the hamate all the time. No, it doesn't. Very often it's so different and yet it yeah. works. So you're lucky that it works and probably why it works is because of the overhang yeah. and because of the uh, soft tissue stability that we afforded. Mm -hmm. Anil, you have a question? Can I just yeah, one more thing. Uh, no, uh, my observation when we do <clears throat> this is like the distal radius malunion. Unless you clear the dorsal, you know, all those additional fibrosis, your graft and the movement doesn't become really smooth. So when the graft is, I mean, the, the whole thing is curated out and all, you just have to tilt it and then clean up on the dorsal aspect, like the way we do for the malunion, distal radius malunion. Then the movement becomes much more smoother and that's what we have found out. That's what Pankaj showed with the freer yes. elevator. He yes. goes right across the proximal phalanx head and clears that yeah. portion off. That's important. Yeah. 
<laughs> a couple of things that I, I would make a point about is, I don't know whether you have access to these or not. Uh, if I don't have, I'm not happy with my screw purchase, I will use threaded K wires and you can cut them flush and they act, they basically act like headless screws. So they're good options. And to your point about how much should pout out the other side, uh, because these are self-tapping screws, you have to make sure that the nipple of the screw is out the other side. Yes. Otherwise, like you said, it will pull out. Right. I think Nikita has a question. Yeah, uh, I have a question for Dr. Pankaj. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, we can use a suture anchor to reattach the bowler plate. Uh, have you had, I mean, have you ever had to use a suture anchor to reattach it after a hemi uh, Yes, then how do you place, where do you place the suture anchor? I mean, the position of it. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, sorry, I was not able to, I was not heard before. So in uh, I uh, so uh, in the beginning I did use suture anchors and I put it ahead of the hemi I made draft and then I have stopped doing it because it it requires so much of a flexion of the finger uh, to just to maintain the volar plate in position and I I don't think I I did not think it was adding any value. Uh, I, I uh, Professor Binu Thomas has propagated a transosseous wire to. Uh, put the volar plate back. Uh, I have never tried it, so I'm, I'm very happy just to put the volar plate back onto the accessory remnants of the accessory collateral ligaments now. Right. At that. I think one of the advantages of putting a transosseous suture and anchoring the volar plate is in case you, uh, you know, make the uh, mistake of putting the angle of the graft a little, uh, uh, you know, oblique, less oblique, then this volar plate uh, reattachment actually acts as an additional volar plate arthroplasty and that by thereby you are actually reconstructing the whole uh, um, uh, ligament box. Yeah, yeah. Quick, quick question to Pankaj. Uh, how do you position them post-op and how do you rehab them? Just a quick... Uh, yeah, so, uh, I, I just put them in a dorsal plaster and I ask them to do active flexion as per comfort, strict elevation to avoid edema, I asked them to start doing active extension at about three weeks, but it is not assisted. Assisted extension is allowed only at six weeks. And your dorsal slab will keep the PIP joint in what position? No, it, it, it is just a hood. So it just keeps it in a position of relaxation, position of comfort. I'm I, Because of the all the repair on the OLAR side, it, it's not easy to actively extend the PIP joint beyond 30 degrees of flexion attitude. And I'm happy, I'm happy with that. Uh, I'm, I'm quite happy if my patient has about 30 degrees of flexion deformity at the end of six weeks. And then after that, they are allowed to uh, uh, have a assisted extension to neutral, not hyperextension not permitted. And only I have more than 10 degrees of flexion deformity at the end of 12 weeks, will I consider any splint to straight it out, straighten it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me ask Becky. Becky, do you have any uh, pointers on what you do for rehabbing a hemi -hamate? Thank you. Yes, that's a great question. So the first thing I want to know from you is how stable it is. Um, and with stability, I would love to start some gentle active extension within reason. And so even if we could move from a short arc motion towards, you know, a little bit more extension, little by little by little. I think here's where you really trust your therapists to be monitoring the tissues if you feel like you have a stable repair or stable operation. And so I think for us, we really hate the extensor legs because they're really, really hard to rehabilitate. Um, and putting a splint on at 12 weeks can be a little bit tricky. So anything we can do early for some safe, and when I say safe, I mean a couple times a day um, just to try to resolve those flexion contractures as soon as possible. Great. Becky, uh, welcome to India. We don't have hand therapists so easily available. Binu and Anil uh, have the luxury of having a department attached to them. We are all private practitioners and most of us have to look after our rehabs and not send them to a therapist until we are sure that not too much uh, is going to go wrong because uh, they aren't very well versed with hand therapy. Yep. So we, we need to be a little more careful. So, so we look uh, forward to yeah. coming over and helping build your practice. What a great opportunity. Yes. And before that happens, for the next seven weeks, AO North America is having a hand therapy essential session going on 
which they should attain and they will learn a lot from all this we have put it out there so i hope many will attend i think so, one quick question uh, from the yes. audience from directly to me uh, we know that it's a procedure most of the time used almost like a salvage thing but then to the, all the faculties are there any indications in an acute setting for this procedure oh that's a good one that's a good one pankaj you want to take that yeah if 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 i find that the volar lip is non reconstructible non reconstructible uh, i would use a hemihamate uh, but let me admit if i am set out to do a fixation for an acute fracture there hasn't been an occasion where i have not been able to do it so surgically it appears much easier than it what i want it i appears on the x ray uh, to but there there is not an occasion when i have not discussed this option with the patient when i go in for fixation right exactly i consent them for hemi hemate as a backup absolutely yeah. wonderful can we move on to the next one then it's going to be uh, ravi bhardwaj talking to us about uh, mp dislocations hello uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation my brief is today to speak on management of acute and chronic presentation of mcp joint dislocation i have no conflict of interest with regards to this presentation mcp joint dislocations are not very uncommon but unfortunately there is a propensity for them to be missed particularly in the setting of polytrauma with the other life threatening injuries and a swollen hand is often missed one needs to have a very high index of suspicion and request correct views in order to make the diagnosis in the very beginning for example just going by this uh, ka view you can see widening of the joint but nothing seems to be amiss but when orders a oblique view and a lateral view the diagnosis is quite obvious with regards to the type of these dislocations the simple dislocation is the one which is called the reducible dislocation and this is characterized on x ray by almost a 90 degree angulation made between the long axis of the proximal phalanx with that of the long axis of the metacarpal usually there is some articular contact between the base of the proximal phalanx and the head of the metacarpal and these can be reduced by close methods mostly because there is no interposition of soft tissues like the volar plate let's take a case example this is a thumb mcp joint dislocation this is the gentleman's x rays and the thing to remember when you are dealing this uh, with a close dislocation one needs to flex the wrist no traction should be applied at any time the proximal phalanx is hyper extended and pressure is placed on the base of the proximal phalanx to affect the reduction let's see the video when you reduce this you should flex the wrist to relax the tendon at no cost should you apply longitudinal traction on the contrary You should apply pressure with your thumb on the base of the proximal phalanx here, and we attempt to gently flex it and walk the base of the proximal phalanx over the metacarpal head like this. Once that is achieved, just check the range of movement, and then you can move the individual towards the next phalanx. Volar dislocations, uh, in contrast of the MCP joint, are quite rare, and the Reduction maneuver involves slight flexion of the MCP joint and application of pressure on the P1 base from the volar aspect. Once the reduction is achieved, the joint needs to be immobilized in about 30 degrees of flexion for about a couple of weeks before commencing range of movement. Complex or irreducible MCP joint dislocations are characterized by parallel long axis of the proximal phalanx with that of the metacarpal shaft. as visualized on x-rays this inevitably means that there is significant soft tissue interposition in between the uh, two bones It could be the volar plate and other structures and this is not amenable to close reduction so some form of open reduction is almost always required with regards to the surgical approaches to effect an open reduction the dorsal approach was described by farber in 1876 the volar approach is described by kaplan in 1957 sometimes a combination of a dorsal and a volar approach is required particularly in late presentations 
And in literature, we come across description of other approaches, for example, the dorsal perfectness approach, the lateral approach, and an arthroscopic assisted dorsal approach. The last three approaches I'm not going to talk about in the interest of time because they are not very commonly practiced. We shall debate on the pros and cons of the commonly used surgical approaches. With regards to the dorsal approach, it offers the advantage of direct access to the volar plate. There is less chance of neurovascular injury. And if there is an associated metacarpal head fracture, fixation can be done at the same time. Mm -hmm. For the volar approach, the A1 pulley needs to be divided. Care should be taken to avoid neurovascular injury to the neurovascular bundle, which is right under the skin. But the advantage of this approach is that it offers better access to the collateral ligaments and tendons, particularly in delayed presentations, if these need to be released. And also in acute cases, a volar plate repair can be done if required. This is another case example, a complex MCP joint dislocation of the left index finger. These are his x-rays, a young gentleman. Now, this is the surgical approach for the index finger. Uh, I've used a curved incision ulnarly based uh, over the MCP joint. So, I think uh, ulnarly directed curvilinear incision over the MCP joint and here's the So, we go between the two tendons, the indices and the extensor digitorum to the index finger. Yeah. You can see the two tendons there. Uh, once we get between the two tendons, we encounter so the capsule. The index finger MCP joint, our approach is between the extensor digitorum and the indices tendons. And we go between the tendons, after the capsule. So, you see the capsule being exposed, and we just put retractors there. So with the blunt dissection, we expose the dorsal capsule. This is the dorsal capsule, which is divided longitudinally between the two tendons. You can see the extensor digitorum here. And on the ulnar aspect, the extensor indices. And the incision is placed on the dorsal capsule right in between those two tendons. And once that is done, we are looking into the joint. The shiny structure, which is visualized at the base of the wound, is the volar plate and not the head of the metacarpal as mistakenly uh, undertaken at some times. So this is the volar plate. This is the base of the proximal phalanx here. And the volar plate needs to be divided with an incision in order to reach the metacarpal head. The dissection is then usually aided by the use of a freer dissector, which can be used to make the reduction easy. That is introduced. And then once the joint is reduced, you can check the range of movement. Here's the proximal phalanx space, and here's the metacarpal head. The joint is put through a range of movement to check for proper congruent reduction, which is uh, confirmed on CM. And once the wound is closed, it is immobilized in a dorsal uh, POP backslab with the MCP joint kept in flexion. Now, my preference is to get away with this uh, in a very short period of time because it's impossible to maintain the amount of uh, flexion required in a plaster cast, which tends to be loose. I always like to shift to a malleable uh, metallic dorsal blocking splint, which allows for active flexion uh, with the use of this dorsal blocking splint. This is a six-week follow-up. You can see there's good extension and flexion and a good functional range of movement. Now, Emmanuel Kaplan described the volar approach and he described his theory uh, of the structures which cause the irreducibility. He says that the metacarpal head is trapped in a noose which is formed on the ulnar aspect by the flexor digitorum profundus tendon, on the radial aspect by the lumbrical muscle, on the dorsal aspect by the natatory ligament and the volar plate and on the volar aspect by the superficial met transverse metacarpal ligament. Now, these four structures form a tight noose around the metacarpal head, preventing any sort of closed reduction. And he opined that approaching these structures through a volar approach was the best way to tackle the problem. The volar approach to the MCP joint dislocation involves a volar approach, which is an oblique or a V-shaped or an S-shaped incision. Once the incision is made, you have to be very careful about the neurovascular bundle. And after dividing the A1 pulley, one can see the metacarpal head. The volar plate is actually dorsal to the metacarpal head. And you can use a Freer's retractor just like this to affect the reduction. 
and then once that is achieved in acute case if you feel like repairing the volar plate this can be done by this approach in chronic cases you can release the collateral ligaments to the volar approach that is an added advantage and once the reduction is done the joint is flexed and the rom is checked before immobilizing it in a dorsal blocking spin this is another case study a 40 year old lady who presented two months after the injury now you can notice the attitude of the proximal phalanx the mcp joint is dislocated but the pro the joint which is just distal to it which is the pip joint in this case is flexed one can also see some puckering on the volar aspect on either side of the uh, dislocated metacarpal head this is very characteristic in these kind of injuries now this was approached to a dorsal uh, incision as i have described earlier and the volar plate was divided but since it was a two month old injury this wasn't enough so we had to combine it with another volar approach uh, and then once careful dissection was done uh, and the e1 pulley was divided we could see the metacarpal head you can see the flexor tendons on one side and the lumbrical muscles on the other side we had to release the collateral ligaments as well and then once this was done we could uh, reduce the joint how because the joint was so unstable after 360 degree release we elected to put a k wire just for additional stability which we removed at two weeks and this is uh, at four weeks after her uh, surgery you can see it's early days but uh, under the guidance of the physiotherapy she is making reasonable uh, progress and although full range of movement can never be guaranteed in this case usually you can get a good functional result so in conclusion early diagnosis with the use of correct x-rays is very useful in preventing these injuries from being missed one should have a thorough knowledge of the anatomy as well as the mechanism and the type of dislocation one is dealing with based on that one can choose the appropriate reduction method whether to try an open reduction or a closed reduction and whether to choose a dorsal approach or a volar approach in case of open reduction once the reduction is done care to be taken with regards to post operative splinting the mcp joint should be flexed in case of dorsal dislocations up to 70 to 90 degrees and volar dislocations up to 30 degrees and this should be combined with meticulous good rehabilitation in order to give a good result once all these principles are followed you can hope that your patient will get a good results just like this gentleman here this is dr evil from austin powers and you can see he's got a very excellent range of mcp joint movement and hopefully your patients will also get equal good range of movements after your surgery thank you very much for your patience here thanks very much ravi that was very nice you thank could you. not appeal to me more than by showing dr evil austin powers is <laughs> one of my all time favorite movies so <laughs> <laughs> Anil and Sudhir, I'll, why don't you guys uh, take the discussion further while I pull up the next talk in the interest of time? Anil, are there uh, any questions? Uh, no audience question yet. Um, uh, can I ask uh, Sudhir a question? I mean, it's just like you know, would you do it any differently for delayed presentations? Would be what would be your choice of approach? I mean, how often do you have to use combined? And if you have to do a combined, which one would you do first? I I would generally go from the volar side. I I generally prefer the volar side. And you're talking about a delayed one where yes. there's already fibrosis and it's a little di more difficult than the acute one. The acute ones are fairly yeah, simple. Yeah, yeah. You you slip the FDP back into place and most of it comes yeah. back into place. From the volar side, it's very simple. But when it's uh, a very chronic one, uh, the only times that I have had to open from the dorsum as well. is when there is a flake fracture or there is a, a definite fracture that's seen on the x-ray and i've had to do that maybe twice that i can remember off hand but otherwise most of them i would be able to clear out from the volar side so i would, prefer the volar side would you routinely get a ct preoperatively um not routinely but when i do have doubts yes anil would you like to add anything uh we've had the uh... two cases recently of uh, really delayed ones one was uh, five weeks old was an uh, old elderly lady the other one was a child actually uh, missed uh, kaplan's and both of times uh, i've i've gone dorsally my preferred approach is dorsal first because i want to see i mean anyway i want to tackle the volar plate so i would go dorsally first i would also see the metacarpal head and everything dorsally 
and I'm a little wary of the neurovascular bundle for uh, chronic dislocations on the volar side. So I would prefer to go dorsal first. That's a safer way for me to do things and cut through these. Uh, there will be fibrosis, but and you can't really differentiate between the capsule and the the rest of the structure, the extensor, this one. So go through as a single cut and then you invariably you will see the ulnar plate there and cut through it and the dislocation reduces nicely. And both of these times, the chronic ones, we have had, uh, uh, you know, good stability just going dorsally and reducing them. That is my experience with the chronic ones. One question okay, to Ravi. Yeah. Um, you, did you have instances where you could not, you failed to, uh, reduce a dislocation acutely and in those cases how many times do you you try these uh, reduction before you plan for an open reduction oh, i would just give it one shot at a carefully done and i would do it myself i won't delegate it to my register i would have one go uh, you know at a closed attempted reduction and uh, you know if it failed i would have a very low threshold to open it i won't uh, fiddle around too much uh, you know doing multiple attempts at uh, closed reduction Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Heyman, do you have any pearls of wisdom for us? Regarding this MP joints? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, the my, my philosophy is that the pathology is volar, the surgery should be volar. The people, uh, I, I, I would not advise dorsal dislocations for non-hand surgeons, but the amount of stiffness is uh, dorsal approach for non-hand surgeons. The stiffness is tremendous. Recovery of the MP joint, I think it's quite poor if you approach them dorsally. By the same token, uh, they have to also be very wary of injuring the neurovascular bundles, right? If no, they go so, so the, yeah. the uh, secret of hand surgery is an knowledge of anatomy and not the surgery. Right. <laughs> Wonderful. Two questions, uh, Chaitanya, two questions from the audience. Please go ahead. For a fracture with relatively thin dorsal cortex and more pylon fracture, that is, when there is a central depression, would hemihamate work? Oh, probably this is for the previous talk. Uh, yeah. Should we take that now? Uh, Pankaj, uh, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah. yeah I, I, as, as long as there is an intact dorsal cortex, the hemihamate would work. Uh, another thing that, that I have realized after a lot of uh, fixations is, uh, as long as you maintain good angulation of the volar lip, even if you reduce the anteroposterior width a bit, so you put a graft which is smaller than the natural anteroposterior width, it, it, it still works very well. So I, I'm not too bothered about what is the thickness of the remaining dorsal lip. As long as there's a dorsal in, intact lip, I would go ahead and do a hemi oh, One more. Go ahead. Anil. One more quick question. If you have a dorsal fracture by shotgunning, which also takes a central tendon, what would you do? So, I, I have had, of course, the, the all the tricks that I showed you are, are, are all hard-learned tricks. So, uh, when that happens, good part is it, it doesn't break away and fly away. So, it, it's kind of a, it's the, the periosteal sleeve, the soft tissue sleeve still remains intact. What it does is it, it delays your mobilization. So, if, for such patients, I would just immobilize them in a uh, very less degree of flexion, say about only about 10 degree of flexion. And they would also get a volar splint, just like you would treat, uh, uh, you, you would treat non-operatively a central slip uh, rupture. Almost same pattern follows and their flexion is now delayed. Active flexion is delayed for about three weeks. Good part is in the end, I, I've ha had good healing of this uh, bony, the dorsal bony chips. And uh, one, once I know that they have not displaced in first three weeks, then only the active flexion starts. Quickly, Great. can I just, quickly, can I just add to that? Sure. Uh, I've had one of them which uh, became three fragments. The dorsal fragment, so it became like a pylon fracture. So I quickly shifted over to a plate. A volar plate. I was on the volar side, so I shifted to a volar plate, had a temporary transarticular wire for a few weeks. He is a bit stiff, but he's functional. All right. That was great. Let me go on with the next one, okay? Good evening, everyone. My charge today is to talk to you about uh, medical 
testing of a on synthesis. And, um, this talk has been framed as 11 questions, which I get asked most frequently um, in my role as an educator and a hand surgeon. So let's look at those 11 questions. So when do I plate metacarpal fractures? In most circumstances, I plate multiple metacarpal fractures when they are displaced. Mind you, that's critical because undisplaced fractures do not necessarily need plating. I use plating for open fractures and combined injuries in patients who are unwilling or unable to tolerate pins and very infrequently for isolated displaced or irreducible fractures. Of course, you have to consider plating when you're dealing with segmental injury, bone loss, non-unions or malunions. The next question I get asked is, what do x-rays tell us? Well, the first thing I must say is that x-rays do not tell us the whole story. So if you are in doubt about the nature of the fracture, getting a preoperative CT scan would be prudent. By and large, radiographs usually undercall comminution. So you have to be prepared with plans B and C. In addition, if you have only isolated fourth and fifth metacarpal fractures, by and large, the fracture might have its transfers. However, if you include the second or third metacarpal fractures, then they are usually spiral. And it has been proposed that the spiral fracture is a reflection of the relative immobility of the CMC joints at the second and third CMCs. In that case, why do we plate multiple metacarpal fractures? These are usually high energy injuries and there's a lot of soft tissue swelling as you can see from the X-ray on the upper right. They can be enormously difficult to control with a cast. Um, open reduction allows you the ability to decompress the intraosseous compartments, reducing atony and edema, and allows you after stable fixation to start early range of motion. In addition, plating allows you precise reduction, fixation, and early rehabilitation. And more importantly, allows you to restore the transverse and longitudinal arches, thereby restoring the length of the intrinsics, affording us the ability to use the intrinsics in the length tension relationship to make the fingers move much better. But there has to be a limit of angulation or shortening, which is acceptable. It has been suggested that anything more than 45 degrees of shortening of the metacarpal or angulation will lead to um, a shortening of intrinsic uh, length, which therefore compromises intrinsic function. For neck fractures, the general consensus is that only more than 10 to 15 degrees um, in excess of CMC motion is well uh, is tolerated. However, when it comes to shaft fractures, the tolerance of the metacarpal and hand function is much less. In my opinion, shaft fractures, you don't tolerate more than 10 degrees of angulation for the index and middle fingers, 20 degrees of angulation for the ring finger, and no more than 30 degrees of angulation for the small finger. Shortening is very, very controversial in, amount, uh, in the amount of uh, shortening that can be tolerated. Data is all over the place. But what we do know from Mac Munier's uh, cadaveric studies is that shortening of two millimeters leads to a loss of interosseous force production of about 8%. On the other hand, shortening of 10 millimeters leads to a loss of 45% of force production. Rob Strauch has also shown us that two millimeters of shortening of the metacarpal will lead to a seven degree lag at the MP joint. However, that must be taken with a grain of salt because we do know that we have about 30 degrees of hyperextension at most MP joints. How do I plate metacarpals? I usually use two millimeter plates and I use an LCDCP shaft uh, for shaft fractures and I use D plates or L plates for metaphysical fractures. I usually try to get at least four cortices and I utilize interfragmentary screw fixation if possible and I fix them stably enough that I can start rehabilitation on post-op day four or five. Now here's a pearl, pre-bending the plate when you're fixing a shaft fracture is really critical to maximize compression of the far cortex. I also liberally utilize the use of 2.4 millimeter screws in the metaphysis if I cannot get enough purchase with a two millimeter screw. So you drill for a two millimeter, but you fix with a 2.4 and that's why I call it the escape screw. Most critically, carefully closing the soft tissue over the plate is really, really important for future extensor function. And I think that's a really bad story. So here's someone who caught big air when he was snowboarding and came off a jump. 
and you can see that the third metacarpal is involved and all the fractures have assumed a spiral nature, as we mentioned before. So we fixed the third metacarpal with interfragmentary screws and plates for the fourth and fifth metacarpals and started the work we have on post-op day four or five. And four months, drilling holes in rock and having uh, an excellent uh, re recovery that allowed him to get back to his function. This 45-year-old fell from a height. Again, you notice that the second and third metacarpals are involved and the fracture pattern is spiral. All fractures do not need to be fixed by a plate. And so we utilize plates for the second and fourth metacarpals and simply just screws for the third metacarpal. The power of plating is that you can start rehabilitation early and you can see from these wounds that the stitches have just come out at two weeks. And already the patient is showing you nearly full composite flexion. But the question is, based on these cases you just saw, is that do all multiple metacarpal fractures need plating? And the answer is obviously not. Some you can simply fix with interfragmentary screws. So what are the prerequisites for interfragmentary screws? Either long, oblique, or spiral fractures, where the fracture length is more than twice the diameter of bone at the center of the fracture. The screws must follow the spiral. And this is my personal rule. You must have three times the amount of bone as the size of the screw head at the site of insertion. So here's someone who's 32 year old, mountain biking, and rammed against a tree. And you can see that he has all four metacarpals uh, fractured here. The fracture length was uh, exactly ident uh, ideal for fixing with screws. And that's what we did. And you can see that at about four weeks, he has an excellent recovery of function. All fractures are not suitable for plating. Neither are all fractures suitable for interfragmentary screw fixation. So which are these fractures and what would happen if they were plated? Here is an example of a patient who came to see me after having a very distal metacarpal fracture plated with this uh, device. Now, in essence, when you look at the x-rays, it's a fantastic outcome, but the plate is very distal. And as I mentioned before, having a layer of closure between the plate and the access mechanism is critical to function. Not surprisingly, he had significant stiffness of MP joint flexion. So in this person, what was necessary was plate removal, a capsulectomy, and you went on to have a reasonable outcome. So very distal fractures where you cannot get closure or soft tissue layer interposition between the plate and the extensive mechanism are not suitable for plate fixation. But then if you don't plate, what else can you do? Well, Abhijit is going to talk to us more about this in detail, but this is the case report that I published many years ago, which started the revolution of how to fix metacarpal fractures which are not suitable for plate fixation. Preoperative templating is an absolute mandatory thing to do. The fourth metacarpal in this case seems very eminently fixable with plates. However, the fifth metacarpal is very distal, much like the case I just showed you. So plate fixation would not have been suitable for this patient. So we went ahead and used an intramedullary screw, which is a 3.0 millimeter headless screw, and it is um, isthmus to make sure that your screw will fit in the medullary canal. You can rehab these patients right away and here she is at about eight weeks with excellent recovery of motion. Are there any indications for lock plating? With the plethora of lock plates that are available, there is a temptation to use lock plates in all situations. And I would say that there is absolutely no need to use that as a mandatory requirement. There are only specific requirements where you need to have lock plates. In my opinion, when you have osteopenia or the fractures are periarticular, or if you're dealing with non-union, lock technology is very useful. Here's this young lady who's in her mid thirties who had an unfortunate episode where she managed to shoot herself with a gun as uh, it was being cleaned. The X-ray on the left shows what surgeon number one did. Surgeon number two added more hardware. Surgeon number three went ahead and treated it and use distal radius bone graft. So here she is now extremely stiff and completely ununited and the middle finger is not usable. So in this situation, it was an ideal situation for lock plating. We debrided all the non-viable bone, cleaned out the non-union, and you can see there's a significant degree of shortening of the metacarpal itself, which means that the intrinsics are very tight. 
So I used an iliac crest bone graft, which was inverted so that the cortex was volar, which allowed me to get perches in the cortex when I inserted my screws. In addition, I also released the intrinsics. And after this was done, she went on to have a reasonable outcome and the fracture healed uneventfully. So what does the data tell us? The paper that is most often quoted is Peter Stern's paper, where they reported only 76% good to excellent outcomes. But what needs to be understood that this uh, series included patients who had all kinds of fractures and the devices they used were much bigger plates and screws. So you have to take that with a little bit of grain of salt. Fusetti and colleagues published a relatively more recent paper in which they suggested that transverse fractures in manual workers were likely to be associated with the delay to union. And they use two millimeter plates much like I do. They also found that stiffness was more in non transverse fractures and complications were more in multiple metacarpal fractures. My personal experience has not been as bad as suggested. We looked at 43 fractures in 19 patients, and what we found was by six weeks, most patients had recovered full motion. There was only one delayed union in a patient who smoked one and a half packs of cigarettes per day and two plates required removal. So in conclusion, in my opinion and in my experience, plating of metacarpal fractures is a safe, reliable, effective, and consistently reproducible procedure. There is a relatively low risk of complications and a uniformly predictable, excellent outcome. I'll stop there. Okay. So um, I'll, uh, if there's any questions from the audience, we can take them while I'm pulling up the next... Uh, Next presentation. Nothing yet, uh, Chaitanya. So, um, Becky, how do you rehab them? When you have patients with metacarpal plating, is there anything special that you ask the surgeon? Or what, what's your special tricks for these? Yeah, this is a great question. So if I see somebody with a metacarpal plate, the first thing I'm thinking about is gliding the extensor tendons past the plate. So really wanting to know from you, is the, sta is the fracture stable enough that we can get some motion started early. The other big question I have is I, that MP, I really wanna put that MP in a flexed position. The more flexed it is, the more I am, know that it's in a closed pack position, I'm gonna maintain the length of the ligaments, I'm gonna maintain the integrity of the joint and keep swelling out. So even if we have to immobilize to help maintain the stability of that fracture, then I know my outcome will be better and I'm not dealing with pesky, really this is where I'm really concerned that the MPs will draw up into extension and that my patient's gonna have difficult give difficulty using the hand functionally because they can't flex the MPs. So I'm thinking a lot about extensor gliding, thinking a lot about the MP joint. Great, do you tend to use uh, ultrasound and if so, at what stage to help with any adhesions? It's a good question. So in my opinion and in my practice, I would tell you that if you let me even get a little bit of gliding going, even if it's five to 10 degrees of motion at the MP joint, I'm not going to need ultrasound in the long term. But I think one of the issues we always have is this thought that motion is either all or nothing. So a lot of people say, when I say I want to try to create active motion, there's fear that it's going to be a full fist or that I'm going to you know, move too much. I can move a little bit, glide that um, tendon past the repair site, and then ultimately not ever have to use modality to get the tendon glide that I've already accomplished. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, Becky Sudhiria, there's a great reluctance amongst the physiotherapists in India to use ultrasound when there's an implant inside. Your comments. So yeah, that's actually, there's, I think I would have to pull the paper and I'll try to do that for you. But I believe that it has been shown that ultrasound with a plate or a screw or even a pin is an acceptable practice. Remembering that, you know, we have the ability to control the parameters of the ultrasound head, right? So how deep the ultrasound is going and the intensity of the ultrasound. And so I think really making sure your therapists understand the parameters of the unit so that they're not using kind of a one size fits all approach is how I would, how I would frame that. Do you think the metal also makes a difference? Because I tend to use titanium plates mainly. Do you think uh, the reluctance is because of steel plates being used? That's a really good question. And I wouldn't tell you that I have a great answer. I would say that I think that it is kind of a common you know, theme question of, am I allowed to use ultrasound with metal at all? And so I'm not yeah. sure we're nuanced enough to know the differences between the plates or that therapists are making decisions based on the type of plate. Okay. Anil, you're saying something? Chaitanya, uh, 
I mean, we have classically taught that multiple meta uh, metacarpal fractures means plating would be a mm -hmm. good option. But you, the paper you showed, you said the more complications with multiple metacarpal fractures. Is it because more plates were used, or what? What was it? No, I think that paper uh, has to be also weighed against the data that we presented. My experience was not as uh, I don't know which word I should use correctly here was not similar to theirs. Let's just put it that way. I am very comfortable using plates for multiple metacarpal fractures. In my hands, uh, with the kind of therapy support that I have, it is really a no-brainer. However, I have gone away from plating in the situations where there's a mangled, uh, mangled hand. And if let's say if I'm replanting at the level of metacarpal shaft or something, I actually put metal, intramedullary screws in them because that speeds up the operation by at least an hour, at least an hour. So. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go on to the next talk here. Greetings everybody. My name is Abhishek Vahegavkar and I'm from Pune. And I would like to thank Chai Mudgal and Deshpande Foundation for the opportunity to speak at the fourth annual Indo-US hand surgery conference, which is a um, virtual web-based learning series this year. And my task is to talk on intramedullary fixation of metacarpal fractures. And I have no disclosures. I'm sure many of you will recall the wonderful time that we had last year when we had a meeting in person in Manipal. It was an extremely well-organized conference by the, uh, the able and the accomplished Professor Anil Bhatt. So the objectives of this talk very briefly are to discuss the indications for intramedullary fixation, to talk about the techniques and the outcomes very briefly. The anatomy and the function of the hand is attributed to the lever system that is formed by the articulation of the metacarpals and the phalanges and the forces that are acting across the system exerted by the flexors and the extensors. And any disruption of this mechanism can cause impairment of hand function. The metacarpals are organized uh, in such a manner that they form a longitudinal transverse arch and they have a unique uh, anatomical structure in that they have a bold concave or palmar surface that lend themselves to the formation of these arches. There are multiple muscles that arise from the metacarpal shafts and are responsible for movement at the MCP joint, but these same muscle forces can act as deforming forces in case of fractures of the metacarpals leading to angulatory deformities. So the general indications for surgery in case of fractures of the metacarpals are um, indicated in open fractures, fractures that are inherently unstable or irreducible fractures, fractures of multiple metacarpals, and fractures of bone loss along with compound fractures. And the principles of fracture treatment is to optimize the treatment uh, which is in turn determined by the severity of the bone and soft tissue injury. And suffice it to say that most of these fractures can be treated by non-operative methods. Uh, however, uh, whenever surgery is required, you could deal with it in multiple different manner uh, that have already been discussed. So the general principles of surgical treatment would involve incisions that must be placed carefully, uh, a traumatic handling of soft tissue and adequate fixation. And uh, whenever there is a displacement of more than five millimeters or an unacceptable angulation or a mal rotation, these are uh, the usual indications for surgery uh, along with shortening and instability of the fracture. So the surgical techniques for intramedullary fixation of metacarpal fractures can be broadly classified as those using K-wires, and these in turn could be introduced uh, in an anti-grade 
a retrograde or a bouquet technique such as that described by E. Fouché. They could be locked into military pins such as that described by Jorge Orbe Orbe and Alejandro Padilla. Intramillary screw fixation, which was described by Chai Mudgal, and uh, intramillary nail, uh, which is kind of a novelty and treatment of uh, intra of metacarpal fractures. So the indications would depend upon the type of fracture and the fracture anatomy, whether it is a central or a broad digit, and of course uh, the location, such as a subcapital or a neck fracture or a shaft or a base fracture. And the JAS maneuver, especially for subcapital or neck fractures, is a very uh, handy maneuver wherein you can use flexion at the MP joint and the PIP and the DIP joint in a manner such as the neck of the metacarpal rests on the base of the proximal phalanx in, an, uh, in a manner that an anvil would uh, act and thereby uh, pressure or force uh, applied in a longitudinal manner would help reduce the fracture and then you could use that to your advantage to pass your k wires so here is an example uh, wherein there are fractures of the neck of the fourth and the fifth metacarpals the jas maneuver was used and retrograde cross k wires were introduced to fix these fractures um, anti-grade pinning can be done by passing the K wire initially in a retrograde manner and then retrieving it uh, in a proximal manner. And then you can extend the wrist joint so as to bend the K wire. And then you can uh, trim the K wire in a manner that it lies subcutaneously. And the tip of the K wire lies in the subcondral aspect of the head of the metacarpal. The Fouché technique, again, is uh, something I'm sure all of you are familiar with. This is also called as a bouquet technique. In this technique, uh, we use a K wire with the tips cut off, and then you create two bends in the K wire, and then you uh, make an entry hole into the base of the fifth metacarpal with an awl, and this K wire is then introduced uh, in a manual uh, manner so as to cross the fracture side and then you uh, rotate the uh, the wire in a manner that the bent aspect will open out and provide subcondral support. Usually two or three wires are desirable and this is a very good way of dealing with uh, boxes fractures or fractures of the uh, border digits, the fifth and the second metacarpal. Here is a case in point where there's a transverse fracture. Again, there are multiple manners or ways in which you could deal with this, but this is just an example to show how a transverse fracture can also be effectively treated by uh, cross spinning introduced in a retrograde manner. And a similar fracture, uh, which is uh, treated by intramillary screw and this technique was, did, was described for subcapital fractures by Chai Mudgal and his team. Uh, these are not my x-rays. I don't have any experience in fixing these fractures by intermediate screws. And I want to thank Dr. Arjo Roy from Kolkata for sharing these images wherein uh, he has used the same technique to fix this fracture. And you can see a very nice sound union of the metacarpal fracture and a full range of movement that can be accomplished. Locked intermittent nailing has also been described, and this was described for low grade or low velocity gunshot wounds where there is combination and bone loss, and uh, a short intramillary interknocking nail has been used, and this was described by uh, Gregory Park and colleagues in the Journal of Hand Surgery. And again, this is something that I don't have any personal experience with, but just for the sake of uh, introduction of the topic, uh, for intramillary fixation, uh, I included this technique. So of all these techniques, uh, K wires are inexpensive. They are ubiquitously available and a time-honored technique. However, one has to pay very careful attention to avoid tethering of the extensive mechanism. Um, there is always an impending risk of 
pin tract infection and mobilization can be a problem resulting in stiffness if the extensive mechanism is tethered whenever you're using the K wires in a retrograde manner. Intermittent screw uh, templating is mandatory. Uh, they uh, provide very rigid fixation and allowing for early rehabilitation. It has a learning curve and the cost of the implant can be a factor in choosing this particular technique. Um, there are also some concern with uh, introducing it through the articular surface, but again, Chai and his team have shown very uh, convincingly that the uh, articular surface uh, point of int introduction of the screw uh, does not make any difference in the outcomes, nor does it cause any problems in the metacarpophalangeal joint. So in conclusion, anti-grid pinning versus retrograde pinning uh, was looked at by Kim and colleagues, uh, and they found that at three months, anti-grid pinning was better, but at six months, there was no difference whatsoever between these techniques. Uh, for intramillary sc uh, screws, uh, there are three series that were published, as was reported by Chai Mudgal and Del Pinyal and uh, Rukuzman, and they all reported extremely good range of movement, almost full range of movement uh, in a series of 86 fractures spread across three series. Um, and then Yamin and Harvey in a meta-analysis concluded that pins are better than plates. And um, this slide uh, was provided by the courtesy of Chai Mudgal. So uh, whatever technique you're using, whether it's spinning or plating, we have to remember the admonition of Swanson in 1970, where he said that hand fractures can be complicated by deformity from no treatment, stiffness from over-treatment, and both deformity and stiffness from poor treatment. With that, I thank you for your attention, and uh, any questions at the end of the session, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, Sudhir, Anil, Bino, um, I look forward to seeing what you guys, what your views are on intermediary fixation. No, no questions from the audience yet. Uh, do you tend to use intermediary fixation in Manipal? And if so, do you prefer pins or do you prefer screws? Or how do you do it? Uh, our first choice is always the KYs. And then uh, we do use the intermediary screw fixation. Uh, the only thing is a lot of times we do, don't do get the adequate uh, screw sizes in India. And also the, the diameter, the three mm diameter would be ideal a lot of times. And that's an issue with uh, the availability of the implants itself. So if at all we have, it could be probably some local implant and that might not really serve well a lot of times. So that's the only issue. Otherwise, yes, there's always an option to use that. And as you've shown a lot of times, it, it's a very good fixation for most of the cases when indicated in the right way. I agree with Anil. Yeah. Uh, we also don't get these uh, long intramedullary screws, which was uh, shown in those diagrams, in the x-rays. So we go for KYs. Now, do you uh, use threaded KYs and cut them flush, or do you use no. uh, percutaneous wires? No. Percutaneous uh, wires. No. I see. I see. Chai, okay. the problem the problem is the size of the metacarpal uh, canals are very very narrow. Yeah. Uh, as compared to what you see there on yeah. a routine basis, and I mean there are uh, people up north, they probably are bigger built than people in the far east in the northeast. So we have a yeah. wide variation. Yeah. And the kind of intermediary screws that we get now, they're all the 3.1, nothing smaller than that. I think Uma Surgical is making something a little smaller than that. But otherwise, 3.1 is a big size for an yeah. intermediary, this thing. So therefore, I haven't yet done a single one. Uh, having said that, uh, metacarpal 2, 4, and 5, anti-grade intermediary wires, absolutely wonderful. Except mm -hmm. 4 and 5, you need to be very, very careful about the dorsal branch of the ulna nerve. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've had yeah. a lot of problems with that nerve, so you need to look for it and then bend your wires away from it. I'm sure Hemant has some more tips on this. You know, your remark about the size variation in a country like India got me just thinking. We've talked about this before. It's a study waiting to be done uh, anthropologically. I've, 
I've pushed this with heads of departments of various central institutes. For some reason, no one wants to take it up. In fact, I got this going with Smith and Nephew uh, for distal radius. Didn't get anywhere. No one wants to spend that kind of time and money and energy because they've got a product that sells. Yeah. We'll That's have to reopen that post-COVID, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. A small comment to make, may I? Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, uh, whenever the, the intramedullary screws, uh, uh, the, the, there is a restraint on the size, uh, I've used the locking head screws because they come in all sizes, thickness and length. And uh, I've, I've used them in ulnar styloids, I've used them intramedullary. So, that, that's one of the options to, to set aside the problem of availability of lengths and uh, the diameters. Having said that, it's not a cannulated screw. It's not a cannulated screw, ah. yeah. Ah. Okay, okay. <clears throat> There's one question. Uh, is there a role for distractor in delayed NCP dislocation? I think the questions are coming a little late. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, let's have Ravi take that one. Ravi? Yeah. Uh, so, basically, uh, the static distractor... Uh, I mean, I have never had any experience, you know, I've never had an occasion to use it. But uh, if you look at the literature, I think there have been, you know, uh, a mention of sporadic papers, you know, one or two, which they have tried and use a distractor. Most of them have been, you know, non-dynamic, static ones. Uh, I haven't had an occasion to use it because, or even think about it because, uh, you know, in a dislocation, it's not like a fracture, you know, you only get that much of overlap. And usually, you know, if you, at the most, it will take you a little bit of careful dissection if you're very careful and patient. And with a combination of a dorsal and a volar approach, you know, you should be able to get it reduced. It's not like a fracture where the overlap is so much that you would need a distractor to get any sort of, you know, suitable distraction. So that would be my answer. Could I add uh, to that? Unlike, sorry, sorry, sir. Yes, sorry. yes. Uh, yes, Sudhir, sir. Uh, I'm sure Hemant will agree with me. Hemant and I were brought up on a diet of external fixators, distractors, we, we help device uh, some of these very popular uh, devices and we did use it on every single indication at that time. For many years, we thought that was the only thing to do that we needed to do. And over the years, I've realized that we, I don't think we get a good reduction. I don't think all the soft tissues are gonna move away when you want to move in in a chronic situation. That's where you'll think about uh, a distractor. Uh, and that soft tissue needs definitely to be dissected out of the way and to get a congruent reduction. What happens is you get a pseudo range of movements with which you're very happy at the time of removal of the distractor. Over a period of time, it re-stiffens. Hemant, if you have any comments on that. With you, there is no need, there is no role of a distractor for MP joint dislocations. <laughs> well, just as usual, to the point. <laughs> okay, Becky is up next. Good evening to everyone. My name is Rebecca Nadeski, and I serve as the Dean of the School of Health Sciences at Elon University in North Carolina in the USA. I'm here today to share information with you about rehabilitation after hand fractures and strategies to minimize stiffness. Let's start with some key principles, really overarching ideals about ways that we think about treating patients with hand fractures. Our first goal is to control pain. Then we work on managing edema, supporting healing, and restoring motion, strength, and function. As our patients progress, we can enable return to work and activities of daily living. To meet these goals, we need to have a thorough and comprehensive assessment for our patients. We assess their pain, we assess their edema. We look at their range of motion, specifically active range of motion in the early phase. We assess tendon glide, especially past the fracture site. We look at things like patient reported outcomes, and I'll share some information about that with you in just a second. And we are going to gather this information at baseline and throughout the recovery process. And finally, as our patient demonstrates structural healing, we can move on to assess grip strength. The DASH, Disabilities of the Arm, Shoulder, and Hand Outcome Measure, is a great example of a patient-reported outcome measure. 
oftentimes people think of outcome measures as being used at the very end of treatment, but I would encourage you to think about using these at baseline and throughout the treatment process. Things like opening a tight or new jar, writing, turning a key, and money, many other activities of daily living are difficult for your patient, not only at the end of treatment, but can be difficult throughout. And as therapists, we really have the opportunity to adapt activities to make them easier for the patients to perform and to help them actually perform better in their daily life during the recovery process. Taking the DASH outcome measure throughout the treatment process, or any outcome measure for that matter, really also can help us see how patients are progressing and help them to achieve great progress throughout the healing process. When we think about early controlled motion as a concept, um, we know that the sooner we can begin motion safely after a fracture, the better our patient's outcomes will be. So we think about early controlled motion as having the ability to influence um, edema or reduce edema, building strength, promoting bony healing, preventing dysfunctional patterns of disuse, and helping to preserve the gliding function of the surfaces of the joints and the tendons. And so this concept at the bottom is one that we really want to keep in mind throughout the process, that all joints which are safe to move should be moved frequently against no resistance and at the earliest opportunity. So early controlled motion is a concept that we can apply to all different types of fractures of the hand. So let's look at them then more specifically. So let's begin with a metacarpal fracture. So let's let's start by looking at some key principles when we think about the metacarpal fracture and more specifically the MP joint or the metacarpophalangeal joint. So we know at the metacarpophal uh, metacarpophalangeal joint that the collateral ligaments are taut or lengthened in MP flexion and the joint is stabilized. And so this is an optimal position for things like pinch and grip in the later phases. The volar plate at the MP joint resists hyperextension, and so we have less likelihood of shortening in the MP joint as we have compared to like the PIP or the DIP joint. And so putting the MP joint in flexion is not as risky for the long term for our patients. The deep transverse metacarpal ligament that's shown in the photo to your right helps to approximate and align the metacarpals during the healing phase. What are the goals then of treating the patient with a metacarpal fracture? We hope to achieve full MP flexion and extension with full gliding of the extensor mechanism past the fracture site. And we hope to transition our patients to graded strengthening after six weeks. So what observations might you be making as surgeons that would help inform not only the process of rehabilitation, but also the outcomes? The first question you'll want to ask is whether the metacarpal itself is shortened. We know that two millimeters of shortening of the metacarpal results in about seven degrees of extensor lag, and that the natural hyperextension of about 20 degrees at the MP joint allows up to six millimeters of shortening with tolerable neutral MP extension, but it might impact forces at the PIP joint. That might be observed during a grip strength test or during functional use later on in therapy. The second observation is whether the metacarpal is angulated. We wanna definitely monitor PIP extension in both MP flexion and extension and identify the potential for a pseudo clawing deformity due to angulation of the metacarpal. And finally, the third question is whether the metacarpal is rotated. One degree of rotation at the metacarpal can translate up to five degrees at the fingertips and lead to a 1.5 centimeter overlap in the digits when the patient attempts to close their fist. So these are three essential observations that definitely, if you have the opportunity to share with your therapist, might help them interpret what they're seeing in therapy. So what are the ways we can treat the metacarpal fracture? Um, I'm going to actually differentiate this into head fractures and neck or shaft fractures. Um, and so we'll begin with the head fracture. Typically the metacarpal head fracture will be immobilized in a closed pack position. We know that the closed pack position of the hand is going to be MP flexion with PIP and DIP extension. The splint that you see in the photo to the right is typically referred to as an ulnar gutter. And this can be made with a cast or with splinting material. This splint or cast is intended to maintain the length of the collateral ligaments, as I previously stated, counteract the tendency towards a claw deformity, and draw the extensor mechanism distally to help support the fracture. Comparatively speaking, a metacarpal neck fracture may not need as much immobilization as the metacarpal head fracture. The fracture of the metacarpal neck and or shaft is more typical and is observed to, um, in the boxer's fracture. Um, if you want to go in, in a more conservative direction, you could use the splint that I showed you on the previous slide, the ulnar gutter, 
Um, this also can be modified um, and freeing up the PIP or DIP, so taking them out of the splint, which will allow your patient active motion while still holding the fracture quite stable. And for those fractures that have minimal displacement and reasonable stability, reasonable stability, excuse me, um, the cuff splint or the fracture brace that you see at the bottom right is a great option. It creates circumferential pr pressure, approximates the metacarpals, and if you wanted to add some buddy tapes at either the proximal or middle phalanx, that could help to stabilize and align the motion of the PIP and DIP joints. Rehabilitation for the metacarpal fracture. Number one includes education, 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 education. That's what we do often as therapists is make sure our patients not only understand their injury, but also understand why we're asking the do asking them to do the things that we're asking them to do in therapy. So when we think about education for the metacarpal fracture, a primary concept is avoiding sustained or forceful grasps during the healing phase. We want the patient to work on edema management and scar massage, especially dorsal scar massage, because we know that between the skin and the bone, those tendons are very close to the surface and can easily get scarred down to the skin and to the bone. We want to have the patients perform active range of motion of the uninvolved joints. And we know that ADL adaptation or activities of daily living adaptation are typically not necessary for these patients, especially if they have their PIP and DIP free to use for light everyday tasks. So then we'll move on and look at proximal phalanx fractures. In the proximal phalanx fracture, again, we've got some key principles. So during PIP extension, we know that the collaterals, the volar plate, the lateral bands, and the central slip are all taut or stable. And we remember that those are all lengthened structures. We know also in PIP extension that that's a closed pack position and the joint is optimally congruent. So PIP extension is really the goal um, post uh, proximal phalanx fracture. The goals of rehabilitation are to initiate motion as soon as possible um, and glide both the flexor tendons and the extensor mechanism. I bring your attention to the DIP joint here, knowing that if we can glide the flexor digitorum profundus through DIP joint motion, we will decrease the risk of any type of um, adherence between the FDP tendon and the fracture site. We also really want to work on full PIP extension and know that swelling can really mask the ability of the patient to produce full PIP extension. So mobilizing the PIP and extension between exercise and or having our patients attempt to achieve full PIP extension is very important, especially in the early phase. When you think about the proximal phalanx fracture, you can use either a hand or a forearm-based approach. In the picture to the right, you see a hand-based posterior dorsal blocking splint. Um, and in the previous pictures uh, for the uh, metacarpal fractures, we looked at kind of that more forearm-based and obviously a very similar position. So both of these concepts are really built on this idea of a closed pack position. In the uh, proximal phalanx fracture, however, we really want to make sure that we don't immobilize the PIP and DIP because we really need to uh, facilitate that early controlled motion and especially the tendon glide of the FDP tendon as well as the extensor mechanism and the central slip. Rehabilitation of the uh, proximal phalanx fracture includes education and help. We really have to help the patient understand that we want them to both flex and extend the digits, really trying to accomplish that full PIP extension. Of course, edema management is always a priority for us. Active motion of the distal joints, thinking about the tendon glide of the FDP and the entirety of the extensor mechanism. And again, for our proximal phalanx fractures, ADL adaptation is typically not necessary, but the DASH would help us to keep an eye on things that the patients are having difficulty accomplishing. Finally, I wanted to add one quick um, slide about the thumb in case um, the more kind of uncommon thumb injuries. But when we think about the thumb, I think some of the most important things to think about in the immobilization phase are whether the digit MPs are able to flex to 90 degrees to help keep that good range of motion of the digit so we don't end up with a whole hand type of issue. We're thinking really um, specifically about whether and how long we need to um, immobilize the thumb IP joint and how soon we can get that mo moving to glide those tendons, both dorsally and volarly. The position of the thumb CMC joint and maximization of the web space to preserve that functional use of the thumb with the web space for opposition. In the thumb, again, we monitor and manage pain, ede edema, and digital range of motion and we progress to active range of motion with focus on wrist, thumb, opposition, and web space components. So with that, I thank you for your time. I hope this has been helpful information and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Becky.
That was wonderful. Before we go on to our case discussion, um, Anil and Bino, I know you guys have hand therapists in your office and probably Abhijit does too. What have your experiences been with uh, hand therapy and how would you uh, relate to what Becky just said? Uh, go ahead, Anil. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad uh, Becky showed those uh, orthosis uh, and we do use a lot of those uh, uh, from the... Uh, we don't really have a hand therapy department, but we have the physiotherapist and occupational therapist and both attend rounds with us. And so we divide the mobilization protocols between these two departments. Uh, the patient visits the physiotherapy department and occupational therapy department uh, together. And uh, we use a lot of those orthoses. So what she showed us, and uh, some of them are, of course, much nicely done and looks beautiful and also very, very, you know, functional. Uh, that's that's a very nice thing. And I guess uh, when it comes to the therapy of the patients themselves, uh, because there is some amount of division between these two departments, we don't really get a holistic kind of a approach. And a lot of times we have to tell what we want to them, you know, in terms of whether I need a tendon gliding exercises, whether I need what not to do, that is the most important thing a lot of times. Don't do flexion or don't do extension. And that needs to be very clear for them. Otherwise, they get a little confused between themselves. So those are the problems we face. But otherwise, generally, I think it helps. It helps a lot of both of them being together there uh, during these uh, rehab. Anil, if I may, uh, Becky and I are co-chairing this hand therapy essentials with AO North America. If yeah. I... I don't know if you have the link already, but this would be a great opportunity for therapists all across in all the educational facilities to log in and, you know, take advantage of this free session. Definitely. Uh, I, I would, um... uh, Ch Chai, we have a, a hand therapy uh, unit attached with our hand surgery department. Yeah. And, you know, Paul, Paul Brand, when he started the hand surgery department, actually started hand therapy also. So for uh -huh. all the reconstructive procedures he did and we continue to have these six students every year coming well, as, uh, for this uh, two-year course it is so they do a wonderful job and as all we also have all these uh, you know thermoplastic material and splints for our patients but our therapist uh, discusses with us regarding the stability of fixation many of the cases which we do may not be uh, you know like the ones you see there because mm -hmm. they come late open fractures which are treated late so sometimes we may end up just putting a k-wire so that stability is not there yeah. so in those situations we have to continue splinting for a longer time so they discuss with the uh, uh, surgeons and uh, decide on how early they can uh, you know mobilize or how long they should continue the splinting and distal joints or proximal joints mobilization all these things so Becky and I uh, would love to hear from you offline after this is done about how AO North America can be of any help in, you know. I'm sure that'll be great. We will really look forward to any help yeah. uh, yeah. from your side. Becky, what do you think? Chai, can I, can I? Yes, go ahead, Sudhir. My two, two paisa worth. <laughs> I had, I had, Becky, I had a, a, a tendoachilles rupture many, many years ago. And my therapist, I have a few therapists who come to the clinic and whom I interact with. And my therapist said, I, I asked them, what do I do now after my surgical repair? And they said, well, when you're, you know, when you're healed, come back, come to us and we will then get you mobilized. And there was this young woman who had just come back from America who was doing her uh, she was conducting two clinics there and then because she got married and things, uh, other things that brought her back to India, she was nearby and I asked her and she gave me three options. And she said, how fit do you want to be? And she said, do you want to be fit for sedentary work? Do you want to be fit for sports work? Or do you want to be fit as an Air Force officer or a police officer or an athlete? And that told me that there is a difference in the therapy for every single patient. And I selected the somewhere in between. And every time I went to her, she said, you are about six days late. That's how therapy is in your world. 
Hemant, I want you to tell me what you do for your patients. And Becky, don't get shocked. Hemant? You really want me to say? <laughs> I do, I do, I do. Yeah, I, I don't uh, send any patient to any sort of therapist. <laughs> I, that, I, I, there's a reason you saw his results and yes. there's a reason I respect this man because he can bring those results out without the help of a therapist and I'm struggling but there's a there's a difference in philosophy also there's a difference in compliance there's a difference in the patient population and more importantly probably Heyman spending 30 minutes with each patient maybe coaxing, cajoling and instructing them I don't know or just waving a magic wand over them but the I'll tell you the other extreme. Yeah. We used to get the therapist to the OT. I mean, whenever I used to do a flexor tendon repair, I used to have them. I would just show them exactly what is the amount of gliding they need to see. And, you know, they have this intro picture exactly after the repair. And really? we used to do the when Dr. Bhaskar and Kumar was there and I, I, I used to operate and everything. We used to call them into the thing. We used to call the occupational therapist inside the theater to do the splint for a child, for a radial club hand, everything. It's you to start from the OT. Yeah. So this is another extreme also. I mean, yeah. I mean well, yeah. it's come down now compared to what we used to do, but definitely we used to do that. Anil, yes. you're in charge. Anil, you're in charge. Don't complain. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I should tell how we used to do in, in, in a proper I, way, I, probably, I, you know. Uh, yeah. Sudhir, I, I feel that therapy yeah. has a major role to play in uh, rehabilitation of at least the patients yeah. that we see. Absolutely. Yeah. You Absolutely. know, I agree. A therapy has a major role to play, but I don't think a therapist has a role to play. Wow. That's, so, a, strong that's a very statement. strong uh, statement, Hemant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because yeah. as Sudhir has said, in <laughs> private practice, we are our own therapists, we are our own surgeons, and we are our own clerks. No, so once, uh, so before we, before we get sidetracked, Hemant's remarks represent an individual opinion and may not necessarily represent the rest of the nation. That's number one. Number yeah, two, yeah. everyone is not as skilled as you, Hemant. Yeah. So there is that also to be taken into account. And they may actually benefit from you know, having therapy support. And finally, you are adept at rehabbing your own patients. Other surgeons may not be. So you know, I, in as much as I respect your outcomes, I think everyone may not be able to duplicate them. But that's yeah. exactly the point I want to bring out. That's exactly the point I want to bring out, that there's such a wide variation in the way each one of us takes our patient from his injury to his recovery. So Ab Abhijit like, wanted to say something. Abhijit wanted to say something. He's go for it, Abhijit. No. Well, I'm, I'm very privileged to be working with an exceptionally gifted uh, therapist. And um, I've always maintained that. And she's so kind of brilliant that... Um, uh, we have a discussion regarding each patient. We do regular follow-ups. We do a uh, you know review kind of a uh, discussion about the progress of each therapy. So it kind of keeps us on the same page. One, two is uh, she's also very brilliant with the splints, and uh, I have already passed on the information about this uh, AO therapy uh, meeting to her. She'll be joining in. And I've always maintained, and with no pride or prejudice, that an exceptionally performed, well-performed surgery will have compromised outcomes for want of good therapy or a good therapist. And a, you know, moderately, you know, or, a, or a, a average surgery can have good results with good therapy and a good therapist. So we should not undermine the importance of therapy, whether the surgeon does it himself or is privileged mm -hmm. enough to be working with uh, a therapist, I think it does take a lot of commitment and time and effort to help yeah. your patient get back. So that's that's just my thought about it. Thank you. Okay, Ajish and Parag, you guys are up next. We, um, uh, can I ask Neeraj and uh, Ashok, how many more minutes uh, do we have? You can go ahead, sir, you can go ahead. Take your no time. Problem. Okay, uh, Ajish Parag, you're up. Yeah, can I share my screen? Go for it. Am I am I visible and audible? Yes. Okay. I would like to present. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Chaitanya sir and the team. Here, I would like to present a case of 27-year-old male, a civil engineer by profession 
and four months post cricket ball injury and initially patient was advised surgical intervention but he chose not to undergo surgery and he has presented to us at four months post uh, injury with such kind of uh, fracture after listening dr patankar's uh, talk of intramedullary k wiring may i request dr uh, sudhir warrior sir to how would you like to approach uh, this malunion sir what kind of fixation you would like to consider how old is this you said four months four months sir uh, did you tell us the range of movement i'm sorry i yeah so yeah oh that's good so this is the current range of i mean when at four months presentation what i would expressly like to know is the range of his pip joint active and his range of his dip joint active to know whether the flexor tendons are gliding or not because yeah. this is poking into the uh, uh, in, into the uh, you know flexor tendons and uh, definitely as hemant had mentioned that there would be some form of adhesions there so i need to know that okay so the, this is the range of movement at pipj that there is no movement at dipj sir but passive movement is near normal at distal interphalangeal joint yeah, first first thing that i would do in this patient is to get an ultrasound test done to see whether his okay. fdp and fds are gliding i would put him through probably pre operative physiotherapy for about a few weeks to see whether i can get them gliding now, all of this is because i want to approach this from the dorsal side so that i can give it a good stable fixation but if it's adherent on the volar side i need to know that in the beginning okay may i know dr chaitanya sir what would be your uh, uh, approach for to solve this problem this is 4 months now and yes. uh, he's clearly cheating with his index finger you can see when you play the video that the yes. pip is not moving very much at all he uses his thumb to force himself true sir so he's cheating there so mm -hmm. he has not only does he but i i think that is um, if we tried passive motion at the pip we may be able to restore a lot so i agree with sudhir that first we have to ascertain that the flexor uh, mechanism is intact if we okay. prove that then i don't think it's unreasonable to uh, correct this and realign it anatomically and uh, then i would open the a1 pulley at the same time and check that the flexor tendons are gliding if they're not gliding a short uh, tenolysis at the same time would be fine in my hands if we did this uh, it would be done with uh, a plate and screws or and i yeah if this patient was younger i would i would have opted for a procedure similar to the subcondylar resection described by Simmons and Hastings but he is older and the fracture is a little more proximal than i would want to consider a subcondylar resection so a corrective osteotomy would help it will also restore your intrinsics to length and overall help function but i would plate it i would not do anything else i would plate it okay so, so uh, may i know sir you may achieve one or two screws distal in the distal fragment will that be sufficient to have the absolute stability yes so there are so the way i would do this i would use an angle blade plate and that angle blade plate will allow me because i think uh, because the fracture is extended you are getting a probably an under appreciation of the length of the distal fragment once you osteotomize it and you make it longer you will have a better sense so that's one way of doing it the other way of doing it in the contemporary setting which i have done is i use an intramedullary screw which i insert through the head of p1 and that works fantastically okay okay so uh, we had done a sonography to prove the continuity of the flexor tendon and it was showing a adhesion parag, before parag before you go ahead it's not the continuity that i'm worried about yeah the adhesion i'm worried about the gliding mm -hmm. yeah so so sir di dynamic sonography was performed and it, it it there was adhesions and there was no discontinuity at the tendon and <laughs> honestly speaking uh, so this was the fixation that i had performed here mm -hmm. one I, i my aim was to i had kept the plate on table ready but i was not confident because there was in my i mean i could only have one distal screw 
in the distal fragment. So I did a anti-grade one K wire and to achieve a rotational stability, I had put one uh, oblique wire across the fracture site. May I request Dr. Ravi sir to have some critical comments on fixation or your method of considering fixing this fracture. Dr. Ravi. Sorry. Uh... Fixation, uh, I would prefer, you know, basically, if I was uh, correcting a osteotomy, you know, and uh, I would prefer for, you know, a little bit of rigid fixation. So I would probably fix it with a, a small plate and okay. get early mobilization going. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, Param, if I may yes, suggest, sir. yeah, you know, I, and I teach this to all my residents and fellows. Uh, if you don't get it in India, I think it might be worth investing in making sure you have an adequate supply of uh, uh, 0.045 inch, 0.035 inch, and 0.062 inch threaded K wires. They're fully threaded. You can literally drill them in. And if you have a nice tip cutting wire cutter, you cut them flush and they're brilliant headless screws and you really can move patients very quickly. Uh, you, would, you would want to put those from where? You can put them any which way you want. Doesn't matter. No, but no, this, in this, in this in instance, I would put it through PIP. Uh, as uh, oh, okay. As a headless screw, intermedullary headless screw, because it's much cheaper than a headless screw. And multiple screw uh, wires or one. Exactly. You can do what Hemant was showing before, without having the three point fixation. But because they are pointed at the tip, you can get uh, purchase in the subcontral bone proximally. Right. And, I, I I don't know if you can see this. Hmm. Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I would I would do something like this. Okay. So I would have a, 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 an intraosseous loop, oh, okay. an oblique K wire, and that's absolutely stable. Yes, it's very stable. Yeah. True. Yes. True. Yeah. That's a tried and proven technique. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, so even with this K wires, a, a proper crossing and uh, crossed K wires, will that be much more stable? Anil, you're too late. He is showing you the result. <laughs> no, no. But but I would like to uh, have... So, what Dr. Anil sir... Sorry. So, Dr. Anil sir is asking about cross K wiring. Will you consider it from distal to proximal or proximal to distal? It's the same basic principle of where you would get the more stable purchase first. So if okay. you have obviously if you have reduced it uh, by an osteotomy and then you have everything in front of you, it's much easier whichever way you want. And a lot of times when you have a smaller fragment, one of the trick is just put in an axial wire, keep it stable, put your crossed wire, remove the axial wire. And that okay. way you can put it in any way. That doesn't matter. Yes. Can we have can we have Heyman's comments on this? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this was a nice case. I would have uh, assuming that there is going to be a tendon problem, you may or may not get a sonography, but tendon definitely you have to look at the flexor tendon in this case. I would go dorsally, uh, do a osteoclasis. There is no, the, I would not use the word osteotomy in this because I would reopen the fracture site, use all that bone which was uh, available as a calor or a bone graft. From the dorsal side, I would go and just put a blunt instrument and just do a tenolysis of the flexor. And I think that would be possible with a wide incision. And I would not take a um, entry point on the lateral side here because that extensor hood gets affected here. I would put multiple intramedullary wires. And because of the tension, because once your uh, fracture is reduced, it will be under great tension. So that will give the tension of the soft tissue is enough to give me the stability. I would put at least three uh, intramedullary wires like this and mobilize him right away. I would get a very good result. The healing which Parag has achieved is fantastic. No doubt about that. Yes. No, that's a, brilliant, one. a brilliant a brilliant thought is that the compression is given by the soft tissue tightness. Yes. Brilliant. Yes. brilliant. Yes, so can, okay. I, can I ask a quick question to Parag? Yes. yes so parag uh, when you are kind of you know you see these good outcomes and you find them to be you know working would you kind of use this technique uh, for similar injuries uh, that come along 
all through or would you kind of do something different no abhijit I, I, abhijit abhijit before yeah. he answers why because he listened to us he's got a good <laughs> result there <laughs> that's exactly the point that's exactly my point yeah. because it's not only us here there are people who are listening and seeing this webinar yes and i think the correct message has to be transmitted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, you know you every one of us gets encouraged by these one off you one know outcomes yeah and this should not become the standard of care so um, Yeah. So th that's exactly the point. I would like to hear from the horse's mouth. Uh, yeah. So whether this would be what you would do for similar situations that would come along. So I, I, I would go, I would prefer a sequence wise treatment option. I would first plan to have absolute stability by plating. If I do not, I am not confident to put the plate properly. Then I would consider a delta fixation, as Dr. Warrior sir was telling about a circumferential uh, wiring and put a oblique wire like this. And third is, I I am scared to I I was I am worried about central slip injury to put the wire from the dead central region. So I would prefer this method of fixation if other two are not amenable in my hand. and and i'm completely i submit and i concede that you know best or we know best under what circumstances and under what situations we are doing the surgery especially in our country so this was not to be very overly critical about it but you know just as a question this is kind of a uh, you know uh, a thought that we should entertain in our mind that one off good results need not necessarily translate into uh similar patterns with a similar kind of uh treatment or case pattern so just my thought uh, thank you thank you thank you i would want parak summarized is good because parak summarized his thought process and the the maintenance of principles thank you sir thank and that that is really critical i think your points are very well taken though can okay we, can we can we before we uh, go to the next case can we bring in becky on this Yeah. Uh Hemant did mention that he would like to use a blunt instrument and try and do a tenolysis. Would any one of us have discussed this with the patient and said maybe you need two procedures? I always oh. tell that to the patient. Right. Uh, anterior of in fact in this case before I do the osteotomy or before I tackle the bone if need be I would go on the volar side take a Brunner incision deal with the flexor tendon close that incision and go dorsally so you do it at the same sitting same sitting that's another approach can we have becky's can we have becky's uh, thoughts on this yeah so after the last conversation there's two kind of themes that i hear one is um developing trust right so you're going to have to trust your therapist and if they're going to have a practice and have a we have a whole um We have tons of journals, tons of literature. Are we have a lot of scientists that are hand therapists that are really intentional about knowing their practice and doing a really great job. But you all would have to trust us to allow us to do that. And so I think trust is an incredible opportunity. I've also been teaching college students for the past 23 years, and as you know, all hand surgeons and all hand therapy hand therapists aren't great. So everybody we train isn't wonderful at what they do, and so continuing education and making sure that we continue to educate one another, but also that surgeons are educating and working with their therapists, in my opinion, is crucial for good outcomes. When I was watching this case, a couple things that come to my mind: whenever I see a delay between surgery and therapy, um, when I see two weeks before any motion is started, the first thing that comes to my mind is that we're losing motion and losing tendon glide by the day. Now, obviously, you have to have someone you trust to let them to put that in their hands and say, "I want you to really carefully begin moving this." Um, and that's that. It's based in trust. It's based in you believing that your therapists are skilled and can help you create a great outcome. In my opinion, and in my practice, and I've heard some provocative things today, so I'm just going to say this: for me, as a therapist, a tenolysis is failure. If you have to tenolize a patient, it means I have not done an effective job of evaluation and treatment in a safe and effective manner. So I will try to help you avoid tenolysis in every way possible. Okay. Thanks. I have a question yeah. for Dr. Mukul. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, uh, you said that uh, instead of screws, like if we ha don't have the right size of screws, we could use threaded K wires. Yeah. So uh, while using the threaded K wires, you take the entry from the PIP joint. So is it like central, or do you take it from the sides? It, so it depends on the size of the wire. If the stiff, if you take a zero point zero six two wire, 
it's going to be invariably much stiffer than you want it to be. So that's 1.6 millimeter. But if you go with a 1.1 or a 0.9 wire, which is 0.035 inch or 0.045 inch, which is the way I measured them, then you can go, then you can come from the side and they will bend. But okay. the point is being, if you want true intramedullary fixation, it has to be linear and not rely that much on the uh, three point fixation principle. So if you're using a stiffer and thicker wire, it's just one wire that you use like a screw? Yeah, but then they don't get rotary control. That's my bigger concern. Exactly. So that was my next question. Like, how do we get rotary? So you use two of them? At least Much more two of them, yeah. Because, uh, see, the thing is, if you use an intermedullary screw, because it has threads at both ends, it allows you purchase at both ends. Yeah. So you have to be careful with that. And if you feel, if in doubt, you can always add an intraosseous loop to aid with rotary control. So that's also an option. All right. Can I go on the next case? Yeah. One, one more case and then we should be wrapping up, shall we, team? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, Ajish, uh, who's, who's up next? Uh, Dr. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. I will put up Dr. Ajish's case. So, sure. yeah, because uh, we are going to, this is the last case. Yeah. Yes, Ajish, over to you. Okay, um, so this was something I faced in the middle of the night one day. Um, a 25-year-old male had a bike accident, ended up with an open fracture of the middle phalanx, uh, involving the base and the articular surface of the PIP. And so while we went and uh, derided uh, this fracture, we also sort of noted that there was a central slip avulsion from the dorsal fragment as well. So, uh, so the first question obviously is how, how would we go ahead with eyes? Started with planning for the plating of the uh, middle panels, but that's not what I ended up doing. So, to the panel, uh, how would we approach this sort of injury? There is a separate central slip injury apart from the fracture as well uh, in this case. Options for fixation. Bino, what do you think? I would probably send it to Sudhir. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't done it in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, oh, well. oh, it, 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 I'm sure it's, it's a really difficult uh, situation. So this is an open fracture, as you said. That's yes. right. On the volar side, okay. mainly on the volar side. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Okay, so here's maybe one of those situations where I may think about an external fixator that uh, can distract and uh, see the alignment of the fractures, see how the, they fall. But that should not be enough because um, I... you will still need to fix all these, the, the central slip, the... Uh, so you may consider going, doing as uh, as you said uh, start with a plate fixation and then uh, see if that works okay. this yeah dr heman yeah uh, first and foremost we have to consider or remember that this is a case of crush injury the injury yes. is on the uh, volar aspect we have to see the digital neurovascular bundles i would not hurry up with any sort of fixation in this case for at least uh, four to five days, once I get the wound under control, remember that there is a very severely comminuted fracture of the PIP joint. So the best option we have got is to have a joint which is working, but concentrate on DIP joint, knowing that it's an index finger. The aim is to get the index finger close to the thumb so that the finger is useful, looks good and works well. So after a few days, Probably I would put a distractor in this case, not immediately. Once I'm sure that I, my vessels are under control and I'm not going to land him in a microsurgical affair. So I put in a K wire here and I put in a K wire here and distract it and try to fix this in such a way that I get a reasonably working PIP joint. Of course, cl clinically, I will have to test the flexor and extensor tendons for their integrity. So, and then they have to be tackled as is it as it is but i think the central slip evolution i think once you wait and you just get it back in place a few k wires or some uh, appropriate implants to restore the pip joint would be definitely worthwhile but i would concentrate my efforts on the dip joint 
Ajish, sir, should I go on the next slide? Uh, sure, sir. So I did, uh, I did explore and the flexitantin as well as the neuroactive abundance is okay. Uh, well, the, we start off with the debridement and we found that the volar side is okay and that's it. The question of the fixation came up. So, uh, so can we have the next slide, sir? Yeah, so this is what I ended up doing. Um, the idea was to restore the PIT articular surface. And then, of course, we needed to have the central slip back on that dorsal P2 base fragment as well. So that was buttressed under the plate, and then I fixed it. But that was actually not stable enough because I guess the FDS pull on the volar P2 fragment was also too much, and it would keep uh, falling out of place in spite of the plating. So I had to put in two wires also to just sort of hold everything together. And uh, then at this stage, uh, I did consider PIP fusion. Uh, should we go for a primary fusion or not? Considering this is an index finger in a young uh, adult, uh, he is uh, actually a furniture. Uh, he works in a furniture showroom, so he, he needs uh, more strength than probably motion. So, did consider that, but then we went and decided to go ahead with this. And um, and then the plan eventually was by the time there were six weeks. I have the next slide. Sir? Yeah, so that was it. Actually, three weeks I removed the KYs. Uh, I guess that says look horrible. But I removed the KYs at that stage. And then at six weeks, I removed the plate, did an arthrolysis, and applied the Suzuki frame and started mobilizing. So I did this surgery and a while awake to try and see how much of active movement this patient was able to get. And thankfully, the central slip had healed somewhat okay. I wouldn't say it was great, but he was able to start some active motion. And finally, a three months post injury, uh, that's what we ended up with. So, Ajesh, yes, sir. What uh, was there a reason why you chose not to go with the Suzuki frame on day one or two? Uh, uh, sir, the, the trouble obviously because there was a pylon fact and there were separate fragments in the dorsal and volar aspect. Sure, uh, with, just sure. The, with just the Suzuki frame, I guess the articular surface would have come together. The, the, I mean, they had the displays and splayed out. Uh, I mean, as in the uh, first X-ray, so I, I was not sure how to keep them together uh, to restore that anatomy. So just applied traction, I am sure they would have just stayed apart and maybe not work so well. So that was the reason I didn't go ahead. And plus, the central slip hours, you know, we couldn't actively mobilize with the central slip hours of the dorsal surgery. So a, a Suzuki frame alone would probably not have been enough. Yeah, I, I, I can see why you did what you did. And yes, obviously, outcome is spectacular. In my hands, probably I would have been a combination of a tension band for the for the pylon with a Suzuki frame on day one. So. Okay. Yes, yes, but yeah, this is this is wonderful. How's the sensation, by the way? Uh, so the patient has uh, the volar volar neuroastral abundance to intact. So okay. uh, the sensation is okay. Yes, no, his, yeah, outcome is spectacular. Yeah, no question. So uh, we are now almost at one o'clock uh, my time, and we've been going for two and a half hours solidly. So uh, if it's uh, Chaitanya, okay, Chaitanya, there's two. Sorry to just uh, two questions. Uh, I think one pertaining to your uh, talk. Uh, what would be the ideal size of screw for intermediary fixation for uh, proximal phalanx and middle phalanx? So for the middle phalanx, them? I do not advise it. Uh, the middle phalanx is too small and it's too gracile, and the medullary canal is very, very thin. So I would not advise it. If you had to do something, you can use uh, Heyman's technique, which is wonderful, or you can use threaded, fully threaded K-wires. So proximal uh, phalanx? Proximal phalanx, usually 2.4 millimeter. And metacarpal? Metacarpal, 3.0 millimeter for all metacarpals except ring. For the ring, you need 2.4, because the ring tends to be more gracile than the others. Okay. One question to Abhijit. In multiple oblique fractures of metacarpals, would you use a clutch wires? Uh, no, I would rather prefer either uh, K wires that are perpendicular or interfract screws. Circlage uh, wires in these fractures can tend to, you know, cut off the periosteal blood supply. Uh, so I would not perhaps resort to it. And it has to go all the way underneath the extensors and the flexors. So why would you want to do that? Keep it simple. So uh, Anil, if I may add uh, to what uh, Abhijit just said, it's a good technique to know is the what is known as the sidewinder technique. 
the sidewinder technique consists of uh, applying the principles of circlage and tension bend all in one go. So if you have, let's say you don't have interfrag screws, but you have good 1.1 millimeter K wires for a metacarpal. You pass two parallel K wires, you cut off the sharp ends, but you leave a stub behind on both sides. Then you put a figure of eight around it. So that's a tension band. And you put multiple tension bands along the spiral. So each tension band will behave like an interfrag screw without the expense of the interfrag screw. So that's called the sidewinder technique. It is, it, yeah. It's a wonderful technique to know. But the flip side is you should have a very good cutter. Yes, of course. <laughs> you have to have a very good cutter. Yeah. Yes. Because if the cutter cuts long, you have had it. Well, it's, it's, it's a troublesome thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are we done? Yeah, those are the questions from the audience. We are done with that. Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, what I want to say is I want to really thank uh, all the attendees for hanging in with us for this long duration. We, my core team, all of you guys have done such a phenomenal job. Thank you so much to uh, Pankaj, Anil, Sudhir, and Bino. And of course, to uh, uh, the faculty for today, including Becky, Abhijit, Hemant. And of course, uh, we, we cannot forget uh, our ailing moderator who could not join us as much as he wanted to, Pankaj. But, and Ravi Bharadwaj, fantastic work from Kolkata. Thank all of you. And Parag and Ajish. Parag and Ajish, absolutely, for being so patient toward the end. Um, our sponsors, the Wies Foundation, Deshpande Foundation, and Venus Safety and Health, as well as the Indian Society for Surgery of the Hand. Um, Ortho TV, we could not do this without you. So Neeraj and Ashok, uh, thank you so much. We really look forward to continuing this over the next four Saturdays. Next Saturday, we'll be dealing with uh, compressive neuropathies and tendinopathies, and that will be moderated by Anil Bhatt. So with that being said, uh, Neeraj and Ashok, you can discontinue the session anytime. And thank you, thank you.